Yes. All right. So um, in case you weren't aware, we are an important part of EMS. Um, and what do we do? We make people more comfortable. We provide some care and we certainly provide some transportation. Now, sometimes the, the most important thing we do is make people comfortable. If they're scared, they're anxious, they're uncomfortable because of the way you've got them sitting on a stretcher, um, it's harder to take care of them and to make them feel better, okay? So making them comfortable emotionally and making them comfortable um, physically is a big part of our job. And we are the link. We are, it's funny. I say we are the link between the pre hospital environment, the world, and the ER, but probably 90% of all ER patients walk in. You know, they don't go by 911. So, um, but we are an important link. Um, life saving care, transportation, and I love this line. EMS providers engage in community health education and promote promotion efforts and work in a variety of settings. Um, yeah, no, no, and yes. So we overall do a really crappy job with community health education. Um, very few systems have ever done anything on a grand scale. Um, back in the 90s, Austin, Texas decided to do um, citizen CPR. They took 10,000 people at a time into the Astrodome, put their training up on the big screen and had mannequins. That's, th that's phenomenal. We don't even have services that do blood pressure clinics, you know, so we don't do that very well. We don't, we don't educate our, our communities very well on things like um, uh, fall and trip hazards for our elderly people. Yeah, we just, we don't do a very good job at that. We do work in a variety of settings though. Um, so I live in New Durham, just north of Rochester. Within 20 minutes of my house, there are emergency rooms that hire EMTs, AEMTs and paramedics. The paramedics work as nurses. They do everything the nurses do. The AEMTs work to their scope of practice. They start lines, they give meds, they do NEBS. Um, and the EMTs work to their scopes. Um, there is a uh, walk-in clinic, a convenient MD type, I think it's a clear choice, um, five minutes from my house. They hire paramedics and AEMTs. Um, I worked in a jail last year, last winter down in Florida, big jail, 5,000 inmates um, as a paramedic. Uh, they had a couple of us, um, one, in each, um, one in each campus. So it is a variety of settings. One of uh, my friends is a... Um, firefighter EMT first responder over at Pratt & Whitney in, uh, in North Berwick. He's been there 35 years. Um, he doesn't do a lot of EMS fire. He does a lot of inspections and a lot of, you know, like sick calls, uh, but he's got a great retirement, you know? So there are a variety of settings for us. We don't have to just do an ambulance or just do a fire department. Um, Go on Indeed someday and just look for EMT jobs. It's pretty amazing now. Um, one of the things that I like, you know, I, I would recommend that you look up. I think it's in the books. If not, just Google it. But the EMT oath and code of the ethics. Um, and those of you who are working in the field right now, read that and think about the people you work with or you know who do not follow anything in there, okay? We also have to understand that there are state and national agencies that have some um, control over us and also advocate for us. Now, this stuff is important because this um, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration oversees our current standards of training and our current scopes of practice. Um, and it's funny, this started around 2006 and it took, I think, 10 years basically for all of the states to finally kind of agree on it and start to implement it. So um, change is kind of slow in EMS, but when you hear core content, you know, that's what we have to teach. 
That's what you're going to get in these uh, in this class. It's what you have to do for continuing education. National scope of practice is what's recommended at each level nationwide. Now we mentioned New Hampshire scope of practice. The state of New Hampshire is not satisfied with that level. These levels, these national scopes of practice are the minimums. Um, the state of New Hampshire um, allows us to do a lot more at all levels. All right, so think to yourself, what are these four levels, right? EMR, emergency medical responders. Um, you might hear some of us old guys once in a while call these folks first responders because that was the, the licensure level at one time, but it really doesn't um, adequately explain their training and their job. Everybody who goes to something first is a first responder. Your police officers are first responders. If you're at the Mall of New Hampshire Christmas shopping, I know that's kind of old school, it's not Yahoo, uh, yeah, Amazon, but um, if you happen to walk up to somebody who falls over, you're technically a first responder at that point um, because you were not dispatched. So EMRs, 50 to 60 hours, um, they're taught basic assessments, basic life-saving skills. They're not taught how to immobilize people or extricate people out of cars. Um, they're not taught pharmacology. They're taught vital signs, simple oxygen maneuvers, things like that. Um, I've done several of these, and my experience with it is that the majority of the folks who take the EMR course either will not finish it or will not pass the registry. And it's because they don't want to be EMTs. They just want to help out the departments, right? The department needs some extra licenses. Yeah, in New Hampshire, you have to have at least two licenses on an ambulance. Um, one has to be at least an EMT, one can be an EMR. So these guys are trying to help out the departments, but this is a lot of stuff to go into 50 or 60 hours, and they just, they kind of get overwhelmed with it. Um, EMR should probably be about 100 plus hours. So then we move up to EMTs, um, immediate life-saving care, absolutely. Um, it's the basis for all EMS. Um, there's a couple of good sayings. Without good BLS, you can't have good ALS. So you can be the world's best paramedic at the advanced life support stuff, but if you can't do what a good EMT can do, don't even bother. Um, you know, the ALS doesn't work without BLS. So this is the starting point. And um, I mean, if I were king and I was running a paramedic program, you would have to come in as part of your interview and pass the national registry exam. You have to pass my final exam, written exam, and you'd have to pass the skills exam. No retries um, because I've had a ton of paramedic students ride with me as a preceptor. They can't remember squat from, from being an EMT. So th this is the core of everything. And this is why all of this is the same for both levels. And in theory, it's the same for paramedicine, but a lot of courses skip over it. Transporting services, certainly um, fire departments, uh, ERs, walk-in clinics. Um, now with COVID, uh, EMTs are doing injections and, and vaccinations uh, in clinics. Um, patient assessment to me is no matter what course you're taking, Patient assessment is probably the most important part of this whole program. Personal safety first, patient assessment next. Because if you can't do a good assessment, you can't make good decisions on treating patients. Now, 150 to 190 hours. Advanced EMT, all of those skills that we already talked about, and then your ALS. Now, an AEMT course is probably 90% very good EMT refresher. Um, and that's why I really don't think there's gonna be an issue uh, with this program. Um, you have to work within your scope of practice. I have to work within my scope. I can't just go off and do things on my own. Well, technically I can do anything once, but the second time you're gonna get fired or lose your license or go to jail. 
Okay, you have to know your scope of practice. Uh, about 15 years ago, one of the um, um, earthquakes out in the Midwest, building came down, a nine month pregnant female was pinned from the uh, um, hips down. And, but the baby bump, right? The baby belly was accessible. They could not extricate her. Um, the hospitals were overwhelmed as with mass casualty patients. And an ER doc on the phone talked the two medics through an emergent field C-section. They saved the baby's life. The mom begged them to, because they she knew she was gonna die. They saved the baby. Um, they both lost their licenses and they both um, faced criminal charges for scope of practice, um, assault and battery, et cetera. So just because a, an ER doc tells you to do something, if it's not in your scope, you can't do it. Uh, medics, some paramedics, if you ask them, they're gods. They know everything. Uh, the rest of us happen to know that um, they're idiots and um, everybody has different things that we do, different training that we do, and we complement each other, hopefully. Complex understanding of AMP, absolutely. Um, a two year program at the tech, probably three quarters of it is just hard, in depth stuff. Um, that should make you much smarter than you were when you went in. Uh, 1,000 to 1,500 hours. Now, if you remember in class last week, I mentioned clinician versus technician. Um, 1,500 hours is probably mid to low end right now for a paramedic program. Um, and if you remember, I mentioned the state of Maine had a 400 hour paramedic program at one point. And it was all simply checklists. He's having trouble breathing. I'll do this. Damn, that didn't work. Let me try this. That didn't work. I'll try this. Um, so you can see how illiterate and inadequate those theoretical paramedics were at 400 hours. Um, Sunstar, service in Florida, um, big countywide system, huge system. Um, this is one of the things we don't do well either. Um, we don't check our trucks. Um, the service I work for, I can't remember seeing anybody else check their truck other than, oh, it's got oxygen, it's got gas, right? Um, tires, oil, windshield wiper fluid would be nice to have, right? So that's one of our responsibilities, making sure that we are ready to go when that tone drops. So each state defines scope of practice for that state. Um, our vehicles have to be ready, have to have a minimum required equipment uh, list. And we we need probably need more than minimum on some calls and other calls, we don't need anything. Uh, safety for ourselves, our coworkers, our patients, and others. You know, these these um Courses advocate for us to be safety officers on every scene, you know, um, and we have to keep in mind the fact that bystanders are going to walk out in traffic to come take a picture of the leg we're looking at. OK, so, um, you know, sometimes you got to bark at people, you know, so they don't get hit by a car because, um, you know, I'll laugh at them at first, but then we're already busy. Um, we have to be aware of our vehicles and every other vehicle that might be approaching the scene. And remember that the guy driving the fire truck might be as new as you are, and he's driving a 30,000 pound vehicle full of water that's top heavy and sloshes back and forth and doesn't stop well. Um, you might have a police officer who's newer on the job and they drive the cruisers a little more aggressively than we are. So you got to be careful not to get hit. Teamwork and hey, Kevin. Yeah. The other thing you got you got to remember too is with social media, YouTube, Instagram, all of that what we do on scene is captured in a second, goes out for everybody to see, and then we have all these armchair EMTs and everybody that's criticizing us for what we do and what we don't do. Absolutely. And it um, 
it can be used against us in a lawsuit as well if you screw something up. Uh, the other yeah. night, Monday night, I did a motorcycle accident. It started in front of my station and finished a couple of buildings down. He went away. By the time we got back from flying this guy, um, some of my coworkers were looking at footage of this online. Um, so yeah, everybody's got cameras now and, and um, they're gonna film what we do. Um, teamwork is, teamwork will make a call go smoother, which ultimately will make the patient care better. Teamwork also makes us safer. Um, if you're not communicating, which is the number one piece of teamwork, um, then somebody's going to get hurt. You're going to lift your end of a stretcher or your end of a scoop stretcher before they do, or they're going to lift it first, and you're going to try to catch up to keep the patient flat and level, and you're going to blow your back out. Um, in this case, you could all end up down at the bottom of the stairs in a pile waiting for a fire truck to come help you. Okay, so teamwork's super important. A and, question about that picture, though, real quick. Yeah. Are you supposed to hold up there on that bar? So uh, I've always been taught you hold the handles at all times. No, that's that bar is the ergonomically the best place to hold on to. Um, you okay. can do you can all do right. even. So if you're if you're pushing them on level ground, um, those handles that come out like 90 degrees from his back are perfect for that. But when you lower him down the stairs um in order to be ergonomic you extend that thing up and you can keep your back fairly straight um and imagine yeah just imagine him trying to get those so all right um, i don't know if that was rigid enough i've never done you know held it by there but okay. oh yeah yeah in fact it's funny um trinity and haverhill um the fire department <clears throat> once you get there with your stair chair they leave um <laughs> and you might you can literally like this guy you could lower him on that tracked system by yourself you you truly could um but more is safer now okay. these stair chairs they're making them now motorized um my company doesn't have them my local volunteer fire department does they bought it as part of their new ambulance it will lower them it will literally like t up the stairs down the stairs um it's amazing so um, next, oh, next Tuesday, by the way, we will do some of this lifting and moving things. Um, okay. it, the new folks need to be shown the right way yeah. and the the EMTs sometimes need to be shown the right way too. So yeah. we'll go over I, all I mean, the different I, things. I didn't mean to jump ahead of anything. I just mm -hmm. noticed that in the picture that. Yeah, yeah. no, that's, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Well, lift, lifting and moving wasn't a part of my, uh, BLS, so I had to kind of learn on the fly. Yeah, that's one of the things that with EMT programs that I really hate is, um, you know, we'll sit here and we'll go over the slide and you read it in the book, but most EMT courses don't have anybody do this. So I, I have students take people down the stairs on the stair chair. Um, we will look at the backboard and the scoop and say, hey, why is this one better to move somebody than this one? And we'll do it. I do not allow people to flip folks upside down. Oh, we'll show you how steady the straps are, right? Because in an EMT program two or three years ago, not one of mine, somebody else's, they had the person face down and somebody slipped and dropped them. Hands were tied down, face first into the pavement. So um, we will not do that sort of silliness. Um, that's a lot of paperwork for me to file with the state if you get hurt. All right. Seeing leadership, um, you know, in the beginning, you're probably not going to be a team leader, um, and that's okay. It takes experience to know what we need to do. You know, on any given call, we need to be able to get into the house safely, assess our patient in a safe manner, in a safe position, in a safe place in the house, and we need to get them out of the house, into the truck, and safely to the hospital. Um, there's an the old saying, you know, too many chefs spoil the soup. Uh, too many paramedics screw up the call. Um, too many people trying to impose their will screws up the call. So we really need one person to be in charge. Um, hey, why don't we do this? Can you go get this? 
hey, let's take them out this way. And if you've got a better idea, then speak up. Um, confidence, um, empathy to the patient is important. So empathetic, be empathetic. Um, not sympathizing with them, but saying, you know, I, 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 I feel for you. You know, I, I can certainly imagine or I can't imagine breaking my leg like that. Um, I've sprained it before and I know how bad that hurts. So, you know, have some empathy for them. Um, what you see are the regular patients get treated worse. The ones that you see once a week, once a month, once a day. Um, and you got to remember that every regular patient will have their fatal event, you know, um, and you don't want to miss that. And quite frankly, nowadays, I just, I don't care about confronting regulars or, you know, I just go in, hey, how you doing? What can I do for you today? And let's try to do the best we can. Because if you do the best you can every time, you aren't going to get screwed when something bad happens or you miss something. Um, assessment, we have to be able to assess patients um, and we have to keep in mind the big picture. Uh, there's this thing, you know, tunnel vision. Where like this motorcycle accident the other day, I had coworkers tunneling in on the fact that this guy's femur was sticking out of his pant leg, you know, his thigh bone. Um, but I was like, whoa, whoa, stop, everybody. How's the airway, right? Is his air is he moving oxygen in and out? Is he got lung function? Is his heart working well, right? That's the most. So we've got to keep the big picture in mind first. Um, we have to stay up to date. So one of the ways of staying up to date, every two years, you do refresher material. Um, you go to different classes, you see some different things, you learn some new things. Um, pick up your EMT book. Once you're an EMT or an AEMT, once a month, pick up your book and spend 15 minutes reading something you haven't looked at since school. You know, guys like to read on the toilet. Leave your book in the bathroom. Um, you know, I know when you're younger, there are different books in the bathroom than when you're old like me, but um, EMT book, leave it, read something, okay? Um, nowadays, there's all kinds of podcasts. You got to be careful though, right? Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's accurate. My stuff is accurate though, just saying. All right. Um, discard outdated knowledge and practice. So when we change things like um, we don't backboard people in New Hampshire. Um, we might put them on a board to move them, but we're not putting them on back, right? And so we have to understand why, and we need to grasp it, and we need to follow through with it. We have to maintain our licensure. Um, so National Registry of EMTs, it's every two years. Uh, State of New Hampshire's every two years. Um, registry expires March 31st. The State of New Hampshire gives us an extra month, April 30th. So if you get everything back on the 31st of March, because you procrastinated like two thirds of our EMS folks do, you don't lose your New Hampshire ticket, you can continue to work. Um, you gotta maintain CPR cards. Um, you never know who you're gonna be talking to in an ER. You might be talking to the doc, you might be talking to a nurse, um, I always ask, so like when we we talk about turning patient care over and l the legal, ethical legal stuff, you have to turn somebody over to an appropriate person. And that means you give them a report. I always ask, hey, am I giving you a report? Because sometimes there'll be a nurse's aide that comes in and they can't do patient care, but you don't know who they are. So introduce yourself. I always do that. I go, hey, I'm Kevin, one of the medics. Um, and they usually answer back, oh, I'm Joe, whatever. Okay. Um, we interact with um, x-ray folks, CAT scan folks. And you wonder why we might do that because sometimes we take patients right to the CAT scanner. Um, I mean, literally, we walk down the back hallway, we say hi to the nurse, they follow us, we go to the CAT scan with them. Um, so you never know who you're gonna be dealing with. Um, strive to maintain cooperative relationships. It's also because our world is a very small one. Um, you might walk into an ER and piss somebody off tomorrow. Um, and it might be a physician, it might be a PA, it might be a nurse. And you change jobs three months from now and you go into another ER, 
and that person's there and they start bad mouthing you. Okay, so um, it's easier to get along with folks because a patient care is better that way. Okay, um, and when I say it's a small world, my I have four kids, three of them are paramedics. Um, two of them work in Massachusetts. And one of them went all the way down to um, Saugus and Chelsea to work, figuring he could get, <laughs> he could get away from me um, because I've been here a long time. Everybody knows me. Uh, he got to work. He was there 15 minutes, and he texted me that a friend of mine said hi. So it is a small world. The reputation you make for yourself now will follow you. And sometimes you can't get away from it. Okay, even though you change, you grow up, you mature. It, it, so you go into your workplace, you go into a facility, you act in the best interest of the patient, you're polite, you're calm and friendly, um, and that will do you well in the future. Because, I mean, 15 years from now, you could try to go to nursing school, literally. You could walk in for an interview for nursing school, and the director is somebody you pissed off 15 years earlier. Guess who's not going to that nursing school? All right, so nine-year-old drowning victim. You're handing off this patient to the staff. What do you think is the most important? So somebody, you know, chime in on this. What do you think the most important thing is to share on a nine-year-old who's, who's drowned? You know, you might be doing CPR. How long they've been in the water for? Yeah, how long were they in the water? Um, another thing with how long they're in the water, how cold's the water, right? Um, so the reason that that's important is, I mean, we'll, we'll learn this later, but cold water in kids make them more savable, okay? Um, it's easier to resuscitate them. They survive better. Um, so you might not quit as soon as you would on an old guy like me, all right? I go in the water. And I'm under for four minutes. I'm a vegetable, all right? But a nine-year-old in February might survive two hours underwater. I mean, I think that's the record right now is about two hours. So if you don't give a complete handoff to somebody, they miss something. It might be that you gave them a medication. It might be that they took a medication at home. Um, you saw them take Advil um, for kidney stone. And in the ER, they turn around and give them another drug like Advil that can hurt their liver, okay, so, or kidneys in that case. So, complete handoff is very important. Um, some more professional characteristics. Um, what the public expects of us, um, you know, there's a lot of memes out there, you know, what I think I look like, you know, as a superhero, what my mom thinks I do, you know, all those things. Um, what we think of ourselves. Um, one of the things that drives me insane is having an EMT or a paramedic, doesn't matter. Um, their pants are untucked, or their boots are unzipped, their pants are half tucked in, um, their shirt's untucked, um, it's half unbuttoned, and they go into a convenience store to get a soda. You reflect on me when you do that. And I've worked my butt off for 35 years to try to be you know, as good as I can be and to make our career better than it was. And you screw that up when you walk in because first impressions are important, okay? I, I was just going to say that, Kevin. You can never make a first impression twice. Mm -hmm. um, um, physician assistant, PAs are a good example of this. They started out in the 70s as um, Army medics, Air Force medics, Navy corpsmen, and some of the early paramedics. And in that last 45 years, they have advanced their career field from being an associate's degree program to requiring a master's for graduation. It makes them a smarter um, career field. It makes them a smarter group of providers. Um, and they really push that themselves. Um, we can get involved in groups, professional groups, National Association of EMTs or um, uh, New Hampshire Association of EMTs, and we can have a voice with the state to make our requirements better so that we 
our we can better serve our folks okay um professionalism just how you interact you know as a volunteer you can walk into a house in a in a pair of shorts and sandals and a t-shirt but if you act professionally you introduce yourself what do you like to be called um shake their hand i know covid we don't like to shake hands anymore you got gloves on shake their hand um call them address them respectfully ma'am sir i was not brought up that way right my neighbor's parents were jim and nancy um ed and i don't know whatever the crazy one's name was um but ma'am and sir is respectful one of my big pet peeves are the the pet names honey sweetheart chief bub um sweetie all that i i hate it and the reason i hate it is i've had i've had some experiences where patients let me know they did not like it um one of my partners best emt i've ever worked with but he he uses pet names still to this day and he called this very sweet 90 year old woman um honey and i will quote her so please excuse my f bomb she looked at him and goes am i your fucking honey no i ended up on the floor i was laughing so hard um and a year later he called some older gentleman chief and quote do i look like a fucking indian to you again i ended up on the floor i was laughing so hard that taught me something a lot of people take offense at that and if you offend them that way right i had a paramedic student walk in with me he was doing the assessment and it was a, a, a nine or ten year old girl with ms who was obviously short of breath with pneumonia in a wheelchair and he walked up arms crossed so why'd you call the ambulance he didn't mean it to come out that way he meant so what's going on why you know why, why did you call us what do you need but both the patient and the mom started crying because they took it like you're wasting my time i sent him out to the truck told him don't get out until we get to the hospital sit up front i knelt down next to her i held her hand i apologized to her and her mom said he didn't mean it that way but my name's kevin obviously she's short of breath when did this start turn the whole call around okay so be professional with people address them properly um you can screw up care but if you're respectful and polite and make them feel like you care what's happening to them they won't even know it okay so um don't screw up the care but you know be professional so integrity um uh 1990 i tested for concord fire department and my oral board i was expecting questions like uh, cardiac drugs and friction loss in a two inch hose and all that crap nope their one question to me was you're in a house with a partner you're doing a search your partner puts a wallet in his pocket what are you going to do that was the only question they wanted to know my answer to um integrity right um empathy feeling for your patients and being self-motivated don't do stuff just because you have to right you know you're supposed to check your truck in the morning just go in and check your truck don't wait for somebody to tell you um you know you're supposed to do your licensing get it done early don't wait till the last minute right? self-motivation you know kevin that's something that i was i was taught a long time ago is firefighters and emts are the only profession in the world in the world that walk into a perfectly good stranger's house in the time of need they're the only one that's yeah. going to be handed a baby at two o'clock in the morning and say please make susie breathe again yeah so uh i mean we got to remember police too police fire ems um and if you're overseas with the military you're going to be walking into people's houses too but you're right it's a very few it's a very few um people in a community that do that um appearance like i said tuck your shirt in button your shirt um 
You know, we're not army. Don't tuck your boots, your pants into your boots and don't have them unzipped with your pant legs just tucked in either. Um, on the other hand, like I said, at night, fire departments, right? These guys go into houses wearing their bunker pants and a union t-shirt. It's got their department logo on it and it's a uniform and you can, it's still important. The most important part is how you interact with them. Um, who do we communicate with? Bystanders, um, other first responders, police, fire, EMS, um, family members. And these family members are distraught in a lot of cases, right? Um, they think mom's dying. You know mom's not dying, but you can't just go, oh, Jesus, she's fine. No, you gotta, hey, I want you to relax for, you know, I want I, I want you to be able to relax a little. Here's what I'm finding with your mom. And I, you know, we're gonna take her into the ER to be safe, but I, you know, so family, we communicate with the patients. Um, when you walk in and say, so why'd you call the ambulance? That's not good communication. Um, walk in, I, you know, like I, I like to walk in and say, hey, how you doing? My name's Kevin. What's going on? Or what's happening today? Um, you know, um, what's, what's, or if you see somebody, you know, like this girl who's obviously short of breath, whoo, hey, I can see she's short of breath. How long has this been going on, right? Is there anything else going on? Okay. Good time management. Um, if you both stand there staring at the patient, it's going to take you longer to get everything done. Um, so like I said, somebody needs to be a team leader and they need to control that time management. Hey, can you go get this? Can you do this? Hey, can you get these vitals for me, please? Excuse me. Teamwork, communications is the biggest part of that. Um, you and I may have never worked together. We're on an ambulance together for the first time today. I don't know what you can lift. Um, for that fact, I had a partner who I, I loved her like a sister, right? I mean, just very close with her, um, done a lot of calls with her. I knew she couldn't lift very well, but she was always very upfront about, hey, Kevin, we need an engine company. We walked into this house during a blizzard. She never said boo to me about it. We get out to the truck in the snow with the patient on the stretcher and she goes, oh, I can't lift this patient. Mm, not good teamwork. What could I have done differently? Hey, Joyce. Are you going to be able to lift this um, or do, are we going to need some help? So I could have been a better team member by making sure she was going to be okay with it. Okay. Um, being tactful, diplomatic, um, very important and respectful to everyone. Um, be, res <laughs> be respectful of everyone you meet, respectful and friendly to everyone you meet but have a plan to kill them nonetheless. Okay, um, patient advocacy. I think this is one of our biggest roles in EMS, being an advocate for that patient. This patient goes into the ER with a fairly mild event, minor event. You know they're gonna turn around and send them home in 20 minutes, but you also know that their home is a disaster for them, whether it be, um, cleanliness or there's no food, um, they can't get around the house, there's three steps that they can't get up. We have to be an advocate with those that nursing staff and say, hey, listen, I have some concerns about this patient going home and this is what it is. And if the nurse acts interested like she should, that's great. If she blows you off, I'll go find the ER doc and I'll tell them the same thing. And if I get kind of an attitude about that, I'll, I'll get on the phone and ask for the hospital social worker. That is their job ultimately, okay? So being an advocate for the patient. Um, it might mean you go to the same house three times in a week. It might mean calling the local visiting nurse and saying, hey, I, I get this patient I've been to a bunch of times. He could really benefit from VNA. And they will contact that person's doctor. They will set up an evaluation. So being an advocate for them. Uh, careful delivery of service. Um, some of you are old enough to remember Mother Jugs and Speed and some of you aren't. Google 
Mother Jugs and Speed st um, stretcher down the street scene. Careful delivery of service. That guy surfed a hill on a stretcher. Um, this is kind of a new, newer theory, newer thinking, is that we are, I mean, we know we're part of public safety and we know we're part of healthcare. But it turns out we are kind of part of the, the public health system. Um, it could be working um, or helping out with vaccination clinics, testing clinics, um, doing blood pressure checks at a um, retirement home or at a, uh, you know, the quote unquote um, old folks village, right? You've got this elderly community in your town where there's a hundred elderly apartment buildings. You go in there and do blood pressure checks some night. Um, cholesterol checks, all kinds of stuff. You could do it with the visiting nurses. You could call them and say, hey, why don't, what can we do to help you with something like that, okay? Um, what we report um, can be crucial to public health. Um, one of the Army's, 20 years ago, the Army's experts on nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare said that he felt EMS would be the ones to discover a biological attack in the United States. Because it shift changed, let's say Boston EMS, 25 ambulances at three o'clock, 25 crews pull in, hand keys and clipboards to 25 new crews, and they're bitching about, oh man, I had 10 flu calls today. Flu calls now, oh, we think COVID. Flu calls could be a biological attack. So if we recognize that there's a pattern, we report that to somebody and, it can be discovered that way. All right, so a little bit of history. Um, <clears throat> there's this thing called the white paper. Uh, back in 1965, United States Congress put together a study because, you know, they did such a great job studying the assassination of John Kennedy that they figured they could fix trauma in the United States. Um, but the white paper, <clears throat> excuse me, is actually an interesting piece of, uh, of documentation. You got to think 1965, 1966, um, 66, by the way, was a wonderful year, um, that um, if you were traveling north to um, Littleton or Lancaster for a holiday weekend, you know, up in the White Mountains, um, Interstate 93 may or may not have been finished by that point. Um, there were no cell phones. Um, there was no way to get help if you crashed. And if you crashed, um, literally somebody, for the most part, would throw you in the back seat of their car and take you somewhere. But if the police got there, they couldn't talk to the fire departments. Fire departments couldn't talk to the ambulances. And a lot of these towns, they really didn't have ambulances. Um, some of them did, some of them were funeral homes, some were private services, some were fire department ambulances, but it's not what we know now. We are where we're at today because of the white paper. It may, it may, it recommended, made a bunch of recommendations. One of them was interoperat interoperability of communications and radio systems. Um, the state of New Hampshire mandated that. 15 years ago and gave out funding for radios for everybody. Um, 35 years to, to do that, basically. Okay, so again, we move at the speed of stink sometimes. But that the white paper is why we're here now. Um, Bellevue Hospital in New York City, first U.S. hospital, 1736. Um, you ever think until the oh early 1900s, even World, World War II, um, most people did not go to hospitals when they were sick and, in, you know, they, they went to their doctor's offices, their doctors did house calls, whatever it might be. Okay. Um, now, during the Civil War, Dr. Jonathan Letterman was the medical director for the Army of um, uh, the Potomac for the um, U.S. government, the, the North, and he saw a disaster at the Battle of Manassas or the Battle of Bull Run, depending on which side you were on. Um, and what happened was they had this big battle 
and pretty much the Confederates kicked the living crap out of the North, and the North turned around and ran for Washington 20 miles, leaving behind their dead, wounded um, civilians who were injured in the fight, because a bunch of people went out there in carriages to watch. This was like a night with Netflix nowadays. You know, I mean, t literally like 25,000 civilians showed up on the battlefield to watch. Um, and it was a disaster for the patients. So Dr. Letterman came up with a system that is still in use today in the United States military. How they do it's changed, right? We went from horse-drawn carriages to um, helicopters, you know, Blackhawks, um, Chinooks, things like that. Um, the, the, the evolution of the field hospital has changed a little bit. Um, you know, to battalion aid stations and combat support hospitals for mass units, et cetera. You know, you're hurt in Afghanistan, you get treated on scene, you get transported to an aid station, you get transported to definitive care, you get stabilized there and you get shipped to Germany. That's how it works now. And that's what he developed then. You got hurt in wherever, you get hurt in Gettysburg, you get treated in Gettysburg um, and you get shipped back to Washington DC for more definitive care. It's pretty amazing. That system's lasted 150 or 60 years. Um, an ambulance from 1901-ish. Uh, um, you remember, we didn't really have cars back then, so um, this is what you get stuck with. Now, the evolution of EMS, you know, horse-drawn um, hearses were used until fairly recently. Like when I started in EMS in 1985, there were still some funeral homes doing EMS. Um, in fact, there was a funeral home here in Wolfboro that, that provided the ambulance service. They used ambulances, but it was owned by, you know, Lord's Ambulance was owned by Lord's Funeral Home. I mean, he didn't sell out until 10 years ago, 15 years, maybe, yeah, about 10 years ago. Um, Ross Ambulance up in Littleton. Ross Ambulance was a... Um, offshoot of Ross Funeral Home, okay? Um, and there was a lot of concern with that, like, what pays better? An ambulance call to the ER? Or eight grand for a funeral? Hmm, where's their motivation? So people, we tried to get away from that. If you go out to eat now at um, Governor's Inn in Rochester, phenomenal place, by the way, um, in the middle room that they have, they've got bookshelves. And on these bookshelves, you can pull stuff down and read them. There's a bunch of phone books for you young people. That's a book that has phone numbers in it. Um, but on the cover, it has advertisements. And it's from the mid-70s. Um, there are three, from 1973, I think, there were three separate ambulance services in Rochester, Summersworth, and Dover. Um, three separate ambulance services that were owned by funeral homes. That's not that long ago. Now, first volunteer rescue squads on the East Coast. Um, I went to a museum in Roanoke, Virginia. The, the rich, uh, the Virginia Ambulance, Virginia Volunteer Ambulance Service, largest volunteer service in the country. They started in, I think it was 1923, and they still provide EMS for like two thirds of the state. It's pretty amazing. We did not have a standard EMT curriculum until 1971. Now, it was standard nationally, but states did not have to follow it. I don't think we had our first true EMT course, national standard course in New Hampshire until 75. Nowadays, you know, we can get helicopters. Um, we can get helicopters to take a patient from Ossipee, New Hampshire, to Portland. Um, they'll take them from Milton on the highway to Portsmouth, okay? Um, advanced care is available on that helicopter, things that even I can't do. Um, and once they start going somewhere, it's certainly a quicker trip. And the helicopters came about Korea and Vietnam. Um, you know, the, the TV show MASH and the movie MASH actually had a big impact on EMS. Um, guys coming home from Vietnam about the same time MASH came on the air were being transported around by helicopter. You know, and if they were injured out in the jungle or out in the central highlands, um, if they were alive when they were put on that Huey, 
something like 95 or 96 percent of them survived to being discharged from the military. Uh, okay, some of them, you know, weren't in very good shape. But why couldn't we do that here in the U.S.? Uh, and that was one of the things that um, started kind of progressing um, EMS in the United States. Um, certainly this ungodly laboratory we had in Iraq and Afghanistan has made a huge impact on trauma care in the U.S. Um, tourniquets until about 19, uh, sorry, 2006 or seven, people literally were teaching people that tourniquets are, and I quote, evil. You're going to lose your arm or leg if you use a tourniquet. That's not true. The studies in Iraq and Afghanistan have shown that. Okay, So we do get a lot of, we, the civilians, get a lot of good out of the horrific trauma that happens during warfare. Um, helicopters, Vietnam, Korea, tourniquets. Now, you know, you do not have to remember or memorize these acts and these dates. I mean, God forbid you do a 135 question National Register exam, you get one question with a date on it wrong. I don't care as long as you get your assessment questions right, you know? So, um, but we did not start teaching CPR until the 60s. Uh, 1970, National Curriculum for EMS. Um, 1975, the American Medical Association, our doctors did not recognize paramedics until 1975. Paramedics were a couple of years old by then, um, 72, 70, 69 or 70 in that range, Miami and um, uh, Dade County in Miami and LA County in Los Angeles started paramedic programs roughly at the same time. So what came about from that? The TV show Emergency. The TV show Emergency, and I'm old enough to remember when it was on Saturday nights at eight o'clock. Don't be laughing at me, Sean. Um, was uh, really a, a vital thing for EMS because you're in Littleton, New Hampshire, and a hearse shows up to pick you up, and it says Ross Ambulance on it. By the way, I know the Rosses are wonderful people, but um, Ross Ambulance shows up. They just saw on TV that this paramedic truck met an ambulance, and they did th all this stuff on scene. And the patient was sitting up smiling when they got to Rampart. How come we can't do that here? And it really did create a um, national awareness. Um, 1984, some folks said, you know, kids are not little adults. We need to focus on better education for that. Um, we started developing trauma systems, 1990, not that long ago. Um, Agenda for the Future, 1996, was finally implemented in New Hampshire in 2012. Um, National Scope of Practice Model and Education Standards. So we've come a long ways in, well, let's say in my lifetime, 55 years, we've come a, an extremely long way. We have defibrillators in restaurants with defibrillators in airports and gyms and you know planet fitness um we have in new hampshire every ambulance is required to have a defibrillator massachusetts is not a requirement in fact massachusetts emts are not allowed to utilize defibrillators it's horse shit you know so we've come a long ways it also explains why uh sometimes nursing and ems don't get along because you know, it's taken nursing 300 years to get to where they are, and we've, we've blown by them in 50. And by the way, I love nurses. My wife's a nurse. I'm going to be going to nursing school. Um, I love nurses. So don't take me, don't look at that like I'm picking on them. Um, we've already talked about those. Now, some key people. Nancy Caroline made kind of the first in-depth, truly accurate EMS, uh, EMT uh, manual based on national standards. And it's funny because I had Nancy Caroline for my EMT, I had her intermediate book for my intermediate, and I had her paramedic book. 
And her paramedic book, by the way, is nowhere near as thick as your books are. We've come a long ways. Uh, standardized protocols. Um, Dr. Cowell, uh, uh, Cowley, um, the Baltimore shock trauma um, facility uh, in, in Baltimore is named after him. And he came up with this theory called the golden hour, which says that if you are a severely injured trauma patient, the worst of the worst, if you're not in an OR within one hour, you're going to die, right? If you're in that OR within one hour, chances are that we can save you. That one hour, think about that number. I already mentioned that. If you were put on a helicopter in Vietnam alive, an hour later, when you got to wherever you were going, you were probably going to stay alive. The funny thing is, uh, so Dr. Uh, uh, I think it's Crowley, not Cowley, but anyways, he, uh, he came up with this back in the 80s. I read an interview with him maybe 10 years ago, and they asked him, because now we look at a lot of studies. Everything is evidence-based. What do the studies show? And they asked him what his studies were, and he said, well, truthfully, somebody asked me that question out of the blue. Hey, what's the time frame we need? And he goes, I remember hearing this thing in the army, and I just kind of pulled it out of my ass, quote, unquote. I didn't mean for it to become the word of God. And it is, the golden hour. Kind of funny how those things work. Um, all right, so for uh, extrication training, um, pre-hospital trauma life support. That's an important class. It was a very important class when it came out because it taught us to recognize those most severely injured people, and it taught us some ways to take some shortcuts to get them someplace faster. Um, you can take PHDLS as an EMT or an AEMT. I highly recommend it. Some of the stuff we'll go over in this class came from PHTLS because it's kind of evolved into standard trauma care now. Uh, Rocco Miranda, National Association of EMTs. He was also the National Registry um, President, CEO, whatever, for a long, long time. James Page is pretty important. Um, besides starting Journal of EMS, he was one of the two um, paramedics um, that worked on the emergency set as their technical advisors. And what they said was, we will help you with this, but the calls all have to be real. Your writers have to get real calls from dispatch centers around the country. We will not make stuff up for you. So everything you ever saw in emergency really happened someplace in the U.S., including, you know, the woman getting her toe stuck in the faucet. Anyway, so um, these guys made sure that what they did was real. And, um, and then with Journal of EMS, uh, they were responsible for educating a lot of us early on, um, providing us with new trends. Airway breathing circulation. Um, so this technical assistance program says that all systems have to have regulations and policies. You'd be amazed at ambulance services now that if you said, hey, where's your uh, policy manual? I, I want to look up something on whatever. Um, they couldn't tell you where it is, okay? Um, resource management. You know, do we fly by the seat of our pants and, oh, crap, we're out of non-rebreathers today. We're out of oxygen masks. Um, okay, uh, well, it's going to be three weeks before we can get them. No, you have to have a, a, a resource management program like, you have to know what you have in stock. You have to know what you want your stock to be, and you have to order them ahead of time. Human resources and training. Whew, I had a big blow up with my, um, hus uh, my service education guy yesterday because our training sucks, and there's a couple of us trying to make it better. Um, so it's not, even though we've come a long ways, we're still behind on some of these things. We do have transportation. Some of the trucks work, some of them don't, and we have to have facilities to go to. In our case, we go to emergency rooms. Now, here's a funny thing. We're seeing emergency rooms now that are called standalones. Um, Portsmouth Hospital has two standalone ERs. One's in Seabrook, one's in Dover. <laughs> Ports Dover ER um, one, uh, from Portsmouth Hospital. So you can go into that ER by ambulance, and get taken care of, and if you have to get admitted, they'll tr they'll ship you by ambulance someplace. Um, we don't take people to from the houses. We don't typically take them to rehab set facilities. We, you know, 
we do transfers, but we don't do 911 really to any place but hospitals. So there's a chain of survival, um, these components. Somebody has to recognize, you know, up here on this right corner, somebody has to recognize the incident, call 911. Now, here's a funny thing. 911, we think of it as the national emergency number. 911 is still not utilized in all parts of the U.S. right now. Probably 90% of the towns have it. New Hampshire did not have statewide 911 until 2005 or six. So 2005, um, you know, well, 2002, I think it was 2002. Um, at, at Frisbee and Rochester, we were answering our own phones. Uh, Rochester Ambulance got an emergency, you know? So the problem was if they hung up, we didn't know where they were. So the difference between 911 and Enhanced 911 Enhance 911, they can see on the screen where you are, either your address on a landline or they lock your position in place with cell phone towers. Basic standard 911 does not have that ability. Massachusetts does not have statewide 911. Um, Action Ambulance that I work for, they do the dispatching and um, they do, or the call taking and the um, like, uh, does he have a pulse? Okay, this is how you do CPR. They do that for the towns that they have 911 contracts for. It's barbaric. Um, here in New Hampshire, it's nice. Uh, in Concord and Laconia, we have 911 centers. And somebody who's been trained as a dispatcher answers the phone, knows where you are, and sends somebody to help you and gives you advice on how, until they get there. So we have 911, we have a dispatcher. Um, so for my town in New Durham, 911 takes a call. They send the information to uh, Stratford County, who dispatches our police, fire, and EMS. Police officer shows up as a first responder. EMT ambulance shows up. If they need medics, they call for medics, and then we transport them. Now, at that point, EMS continues in our ERs, um, our specialty care, our stroke care, our trauma care, our pediatric care. Um, they get admitted, they get taken care of, they get discharged to home, they get transferred to another hospital, or they get sent for rehabilitation. They get taught, if they were an injury, a trauma patient, they get taught some prevention things, um, and hopefully we're doing public education. It says that we have to have a communication system that works. Um, again, not everyone has good radio systems. We have to have, we're supposed to have public information education. We all, in New, we do have medical direction. The states are a little different. Um, Massachusetts still does stuff regionally. Maine does stuff regionally. New Hampshire, it's statewide. We have statewide set of protocols. We have a physician who is our statewide medical director. The state says, this is our protocol for gunshot wounds, trauma. Um, this is what you can do. These are your options. This is where you should take them. You work in Massachusetts or Maine, you're in York County, Maine, your protocols might be different from uh, whatever the next county up is. Um, that's crazy. Uh, I hate that. I, I, like, I like consistency. The New England states are trying to get together and create a regional, a New England set of protocols. It's not happening though right now because <clears throat> the other states want to, our state wants to use ours because ours are the best. And the other states want to dumb them down and say, oh, we don't trust our people to do that. The state of New Hampshire says, well, then tough shit. We're not going with, with regional protocols. Um, we have to have trauma systems. So we have a motorcycle accident in Ossipee. Can he go to Huggins? If he's got minor injuries, sure. If he's got bad injuries, he needs to go to a trauma center. And where are our closest trauma centers, okay? And we have to have a system to evaluate our systems. Um, we have to evaluate how our system functions and how our providers function. And where do we have room for improvement? We have to have education. The state has to have control over this. So like as a state, I'm a state instructor. I'm my own business, but I am licensed by the state of New Hampshire. I've been through training that they require. 
And I have con ed that I'm required to do every two years as an instructor also. You have to maintain licensure. Um, so anyways, we've covered the rest of those. But the state makes some of those decisions. Nationally, there are recommendations from all of these things that we've already talked about. Now, fire systems, absolutely, right? Um, you know, uh, Concord Fire does fire and EMS. Portsmouth Fire, Dover Fire, Exeter, Hampton. Um, but within that, then you've got Frisbee Hospital, right? Frisbee EMS does the city of Rochester, which includes Gonic, East Rochester, and Rochester. And they do intercepts any place that'll call them. So hospital-based. Huggins Hospital does not have any 911 contracts, but they have an intercept car. You know, paramedical go out and meet people. Private services contracted by local governments, Manchester and Nashua, American Medical Response, Wolfboro, um, Stewart's, um, Summersworth, Stewart's, okay? Um, the towns I work for with action. Municipal third services. <clears throat> so in Florida, county systems are a big deal. Um, um, Sarasota County, Manatee County, um, they have county fire department, they have county EMS. Hillsboro runs fire EMS together, okay? Staffing configurations vary. Some systems have three people on an ambulance, that's their rule. Um, others have just the two. Um, just like some systems will run a four, a four person engine company, some will only run three. Sometimes you're lucky to get two. And there are times in volunteer systems, well, there are times in Rochester where one person will run an engine, hoping that they're the second engine in, they're hoping the uh, call department will show up and man the rest of it. Um, so we need to be experts in our clinical knowledge. We need to have good interpersonal skills. Physically, we need to be healthy. If we can't pick people up and carry them effectively, we can't do it. If we get short of breath walking up a flight of stairs, you can't do your job. All right, so we covered 911. How do we select EMS vehicles? That's by system. You know, what do we need for an ambulance? What do we staff it with? You know, are we conquered fire and we have rescue stuff on it and we carry our bunker gear in it and all that? Or are we uh, a basic life support EMT truck that can fit in a van, okay? Some contracts uh, mandate this. So the city of Manchester mandates your trucks have to be this style truck, they have to be this age or newer, and they can only have this much mileage, and they have to have this set of equipment on it. It's a little bit of uh, OCD, but some contracts call for that. Now, every service has to have a medical director. As I said, in New Hampshire, we have a state medical director, but each service is assigned to a hospital, and we call that hospital our resource hospital. So that hospital also has a medical director, and they're supposed to help us with our education. They're supposed to help us with our, our what we call quality assurance or quality improvement, how we look at our training, how we look at our providers, and how can we make our training better. Um, and they're there to help teach us. They're there to help to advise us as well. Some of the things that all systems, all 911 systems are marked by, and it's usually a contract issue, you have to have a set response time. So like 90% of the time, you have to be on scene within nine minutes. Your scene time should be no longer than 20, 30, 40, whatever. Um, how long are you out of service after a call? And why are you out of service? Right now with COVID, Ambulances are out of service a lot because of decontamination. Um, are we compliant with our protocols? Um, are we compliant with our paperwork? And, you know, hospitals send out questionnaires all the time. Hey, um, thank you for coming in and using our emergency room last week. We hope you're feeling better. Would you take five minutes to do a, a questionnaire? And the hospitals that do that well then send out notes to their staff and say, hey, um, you know, somebody last week that you took care of said you are wonderful. Um, you took really good care of their mother. Some ambulance services do that, and uh, but a lot don't. 
if you don't if you don't know whether you're you're doing a good job you can't improve it so a cqi plan quality improvement continuous quality improvement <clears throat> so let's say we're an ambulance service we're kevin's ambulance and i say i want to know if we're doing things well i want to know how we can make it better i want four of you to be on our cqi committee and the four of you will decide what we're going to look at this month. So this month, we're going to look at just documentation. We're going to look at every run sheet. And you guys come to me next month and say, you know, Kevin, we're finding that 25% of our run sheets are incomplete. We don't have names, insurance, whatever it is. So now we turn to the training crew those three people and say, can you come up with a short training plan to address this? Next month, the QI folks look at it again. Hey, we fixed it. So that's the way this is supposed to work. Unfortunately, sometimes QI gets a bad rap for being um, punitive because they look at run sheets and they call you in and go, hey, you screwed up this call again, dude. Um, it's not the way it's supposed to work. Okay. Whoop. So why do all these things exist? To make patients' lives better, right? We, 1972, if you called the ambulance number in the city of Manchester, the city ambulance number, the police dispatcher sent a mechanic in an international scout, an SUV, to your neighborhood, got your foot patrol officer, they went to your house, literally dragged you down the stairs, threw you back at the SUV, and took you to the Elliott or CMC, dragged you inside, and left you there. Do patients have better quality of life after they get seen in the ER based on that system or based on our system, right? Our system, hopefully, is going to be better. But that also is why rehab facilities exist now. So people can get stronger. They can learn how to walk again, all those things, okay? <clears throat> we interact with everybody. Public health systems are to make lives better. Getting to the future. Any one of us can play a part in this. <clears throat> I always love to teach people how to be better providers. I always mentored people. And I started thinking about it and said, you know, I'm doing this one person at a time. How can I make a bigger improvement or a bigger, you know, a, um, impact? I can teach. And so I do 10, 12, 15 people at a time. I try to impart some wisdom in them and some experience and some tricks that make things better and easier for them to make patient care better. And those 10 or 15 people go out three times a day and I have a bigger impact. I'm now branching out with a YouTube channel because if I can get, and these all these videos are free, if I can make that impact, God, I mean, somebody in Wyoming or Vietnam or Cambodia or wherever might watch one of my videos and go, hey, we can do that here. Why aren't we doing that here? That's cool. So anybody, even some schmuck from New Durham, New Hampshire, can have an impact on how things move forward. Get involved at the state level. Um, volunteer for committees. Get involved with your service. Hey, we're trying to um, come up with a training program for new employees. Hey, I'll help with that, okay? We have to continue to develop. If you don't continue to move forward, you stagnate. Stagnation is disease and death for a system, okay? So we, re, we evolved from the need to reduce preventable deaths on the highway, the white paper, to what we have now. All right, what time we got here? All right, so now we're gonna go into a little bit of how we keep ourselves healthy and safe. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of safe stuff at the very end though. Um, I just realized that my glasses have quite the glare off them. I apologize if I take them off though, class is over. Um, 
in order to be healthy, whether it's us as a provider or a patient, we need to be emotionally stable, <laughs> right? Um, socially stable, spiritually stable. Now you may not have, your religious belief may be agnostic or an atheist. That, that's fine. That is your spiritual belief. And as long as you're happy and healthy with that, that's an important piece of this. Um, if spiritually you're struggling with something, it's going to affect your entire health. So whether it's emotional stress or spiritual stress, I, I always advocate to people that if you're having difficulty in one of these arenas, go get some help with it. Right? Occupationally, if you're not happy at work, go get another job. Um, go back to school. I, I mean, um, McDonald's in um, Conway, North Conway, is paying 14 bucks an hour for a janitor right now. It's a, it's a sign out front, you know? I mean, th there are jobs out there right now. N every place, every company has job openings right now because of COVID. Um, if you're not happy, go get go find something else to do. If you're not happy working for Stewart's and Lifeline, go try action. Go try AMR, go whatever, okay? Um, try something different. Um, try occupational health, go work for, um, you know, um, GE or whatever. Intellectually, again, you need to continue to improve or you stagnate. Physically, now, n n you guys don't know me, and I mean, you didn't know me until the other night. Um, you, if you knew me five years ago, you wouldn't recognize me now. I mean, I, I have, people who walk up to me now at Walmart and they walk right by me because five years ago, I weighed 325 pounds. Okay. Um, you know, I'm 195 right now. So I made, and I was super, I, I was not healthy. Um, I was having chest pains that they said wasn't my heart. Um, everything hurt. My knees hurt. My back hurt. My neck hurt. Everything hurt. Um, I was so out of shape. It was beyond belief. Um, and I made a decision that if I wanted to live to see grandchildren, I needed to get physically healthy. And I am much emotionally, I'm significantly happier now. Socially, I'm not as cranky because I can't do things that other people are doing, right? Um, and I'm just, I'm more interactive. So physical health is is one of the most important things with this. And environmentally, um, you know, we live in New, well, you, you might live in Mass, but, you know, I live in New Hampshire. Most of us live in New Hampshire. Winters suck unless you ski, you snowboard, or you snowmobile. Other than that, you know, I hate winter. Um, I have found a way environmentally to be happy. So starting next month, 10 days out of every month, I go to Florida. I got an RV. I'm going to be in Florida. Um, some of these classes, you're going to see me. It's snowing like hell at your house, and you're going to be looking off the back um, patio of my camper at palm trees. <laughs> Environmentally and emotionally, I'm going to be very happy. We need this. If you're not happy, move. You know, I can't move. I got family here. You know, I got a grandson now, but um, I'm doing something. I've made some changes, so I'm happier with life. Now, the World Health Organization. Whether you are a fan of them or not, um, since uh, the summer of COVID, um, but whatever, state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It's not merely absence of disease or infirmity. So um, my chiropractor's had 35 years. I've been seeing a chiropractor. She has a big poster on the wall that says that um, just because you're not sick does not mean you're healthy. All right. Now, we need to be role models. If you're telling somebody that their asthma and COPD is going to get worse if they don't quit smoking, and you chain smoke and they can smell it on you, that's hypocritical. They're not, you know, your, your um, advice is not going to be well taken, okay? So if you're healthy, you can give healthy advice. Um, 
And again, that role in promotion and public health. Uh, blood drives. Uh, New Durham Fire Department, right? A dinky little town, 2,500 people. Our fire department has the blood um, blood mobile come into town. I think it's every six or eight weeks. And they do blood drives at the fire department. I think that's wonderful. All right. So think about this for a minute. How does shift work impact us? Right? What what somebody answer this for me? What's the most common private EMS shift in uh right now? 24 hour shift from like 24 hours. 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. the next day. Yep, and they suck. Why do they why do we still use them though? Because it's nice to work two days and have five days off. Absolutely. But if you're in a busy system, that day, that first day off, it, you're spent. You've been up all night. You're cranky at home. Um, you're not healthy. Um, and they're dangerous. 24-hour shifts have been proven to be dangerous. After midnight, our chances of dying in a car wreck, an ambulance wreck, skyrocket exponentially. But services keep using them because they can't recruit if they don't. Every ambulance service in New Hampshire right now has dire need for employees at all levels. Every one of them. Um, they're begging for, for providers. And if they don't give, you know, that's one of the things um, Frisbee Hospital has always struggled with recruiting because they do 12-hour shifts because they work in the ER just like the nurses and they have to be up at night just like the nurses working in the ER. You can't do that with a 24. Um, fast food and caffeine, fast food makes you fat. I'm living proof of that. Um, caffeine is not good for you. Um, I mean, all things in moderation, but uh, caffeine is not good for you. Caffeine is also one of the uh, biggest uh, causes of ulcers, by the way. Caffeine stimulates um, the uh, acid pump in your stomach. So 2010, they came out, or 2009, they came out with this healthy people goal for 2010 um, and ways that we can improve life physical activity, become more active. One of the things I started doing was walking. I walked four times a week, every other day, basically. Um, and I started out literally walking half a mile. That's all I could walk. And within a couple months, I was doing four miles a day. Um, just be a little active. Um, if you, so one of my slides in um, the refresher program has a statement by this guy from, um, um, EMS one, uh, an EMS website. And it says that if you can't do 15 sit-ups, um, you can't protect your core from injury. Your core includes your back muscles, 15 sit-ups. Um, I couldn't do them. Um, you know, I can jam out 75 now, but I couldn't do, I couldn't do 15 then. Um, smoking. So that all leads to overweight and obesity, which leads to high blood pressure, which leads to coronary artery disease and diabetes and you know strokes, heart attacks, et cetera, um, needing knee joints. Smoking takes years and years and years off your life. Substance abuse. Nobody in medicine abuses substances, right? No. Um, drinking, drugging. Responsible sexual behavior. Um, I would anticipate or I could imagine that syphilis and gonorrhea and HIV probably puts a cramp in your um, health, um, which leads to some of those other um, unhealthy things. Um, mental health, injury and violence, protecting ourselves from injury, um, protecting ourselves from violence, both at home and at work. Um, we don't have enough time tonight to talk about domestic violence. Environmental qualities. Um, I read a study once that said something like 90% of all asthmatic kids that from the big cities that moved out to the country grew up, uh, out, out grew their asthma is the way people originally thought it was. It's not. Um, what it was is that what was triggering their asthmatic type symptoms was the amount of cockroach poop in the walls of their apartment buildings in the big cities. That's a lot of, anyways, um, so environmental quality, um, immunizations, if you're an anti-vaxxer, uh, 
okay, you live with your your beliefs. But we do know that things like smallpox don't occur for the most part anymore because we've been vaccinated since we were kids. Um, um, we have anthrax vaccines that work, um, polio, um, TB, all those vaccines work. This one works. Um, I know it's new and people don't want to be the first ones to get anything, but this vaccine, people do get COVID with it, but the ones that get it, the acuity is significantly lower. Um, and the flu shot, people are like, I'm not doing the flu shot. I, I'm young. I'm healthy. I get the flu shot every year. Worst case scenario, it doesn't work. But I haven't had the flu and I can't remember how long. And I've been getting the flu shot since I was 21 years old. So access to health care. Not everybody has good access to health care. Big cities, you think, oh, Boston has like 10 hospitals. Yeah, but you can't get into appointments there because they're so busy. Um, their doctor's offices are, are jammed. Um, you go out to the rural areas in the Appalachian Mountains, you can't get health care either. So we need to improve that. Uh, genetics play a part in it. Environment plays a part. Cultural beliefs. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses will not accept blood products. You get shot and you're bleeding and you need blood, you're going to die because it is against their religious belief. Okay. Um, some of the cultures that we are becoming more exposed to and will become more exposed to with all the um, uh, immigration from the um, Iraq, Afghanistan, that whole area is um, um, the cultural belief in the sexes, right? You're a female ER doc. Um, that's great. You can touch the guy's wife and you can take care of him, but you're a male ER doc. Guess what? Don't touch my wife. You can't take care of her. You can't look at her without her thing on, okay? And I've seen that at Huggins. I, I, I was barred from doing even vital signs on a female patient by her husband because I was male, okay? Um, level of education. The smarter people, the smarter our communities are, the more resources we get from those people as well. Um, socioeconomic, right? Um, the really poor areas get a lot of money to make things better, but kind of that average blue collar community who are just barely making it, don't always get the resources. So physical needs, physio, uh, physiological needs, right? Are we fed? Are we warm? Are we cool? Whatever. Um, are we safe? Do we have interaction with people? Um, what's my self-esteem? Um, do I think I'm a piece of shit and um, I'm not worthy of anything? Um, Self-esteem right? Esteem. and can we go out and do what we want to do for ourselves? So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this is Psych 101. I wouldn't spend a lot of time for this, but this is what we just, what that little diagram just said that we have to do these things in order to be all, an old army term, be all that you can be. You can't be all you can be if any one of those links are missing. Now, as far as stress, this little chart shows that if you have a low amount of stress, you're inactive, you're laid back, it takes a little bit of effort for you to get rolling and for you to become um, effective. Medium amounts of stress, or in this case, they, they use the term arousal, um, bam, bam, bam. If you're kind of aware of what's going on around you, you can jump into it quicker. Too much stress, though, overloads the brain and your efficiency drops significantly. Now, stress Stress is our response. It can be emotional stress or it can be a phys physical stress, physiological stress, right? Um, that stressor stimulates a response. Um, it might be, I'm sitting in my chair, eating cheesy poofs, watching the Red Sox get their butts kicked again, and the front door gets kicked open. The stress of that, that response is, I have to get up and either run away 
or I have to get up and fight to the death with whoever's coming in that front door. Okay. Or it could be, um, I'm at work and my boss dumps a project on my desk and says, I need this in an hour. Ah, emotional stress. Um, it, and that, that stress is different than the, the physiological stress of fighting. Okay. Now, stages of stress. I, I love this part of it. Um, fight or flight. So first stage of stress is alarm. The door gets kicked in. Bam. Um, this is what is called a sympathetic response, sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system releases chemicals, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, adrenaline. And, you know, if it's internal, it's adrenaline. Um, norepinephrine and uh, a drug, uh, a, a chemical called dopamine. And it wants us to fight to the death or run away as fast as you can. I'm in my living room and you kick in my front door. I'm not running. I don't run anyways, okay? Um, one of us has to die now. So how do I accomplish either running or fighting? Some of my blood vessels get bigger so that I get more blood to the big muscles, the, the, the quads on the front of my legs, the hamstrings on the back of my legs, um, my chest muscles, my abdominal muscles, my shoulders, so I can twist, turn, punch, pull, throw, kick, or run. In order for those, those blood vessels get open, but in order for those muscles to work, your heart has to pump faster. You have to breathe deeper and you have to bring in more oxygen. So the bronchioles, the tubes in your lungs will get bigger also. So air moves easier. You can bring more oxygen in, you can get rid of more, um, more trash from the cells. Fight or flight. This physiological environment is healthy in short bursts, two to five minutes. And then your body starts to cope, second stage, resistance. You know, that threat has gone away. Uh, it turns out nobody kicked the door. My boy just didn't shut the door tight and the wind blew it open. Now I'm breathing 25 times a minute. My heart's beating 140 times a minute and I'm shaky, right? I get so much adrenaline, I just kill something, right? So now the body says, okay, ooh, baby, slow down, go back to normal. It slows the heart down. It shrinks those blood vessels. It makes other ones bigger again. It shrinks my bronchioles. And 10 or 15 minutes later, ah, I'm back to watching the Red Sox. But now I'm exhausted because I, my body just ran a marathon. And I'm asleep. I wake up three innings later and I'm like, oh, my God, they, they lost again, right? So... The problem with this system is the longer you are exposed to this <clears throat> alarms, you know, first stage, the longer it takes for you to get back to normal and, and cope, the more exhausted you are. My daughter's first call is a paramedic in Haverhill. A 20 year old mother came out to her. My daughter was 22, handed her a baby that was not breathing and was dead and said, screamed at her, save my baby. First call, it's a paramedic. First stage, alarm. Do you think she had a significant sympathetic response? Absolutely. How long did that last? All the way to the hospital, right? And in the hospital, until they handed the baby off to the docs, they stayed around and helped him for a while. And then she walked outside, ugh, and that second stage started. 45 minutes to an hour, right? How tired was she? I'll bet you she fell asleep on the way back to the station, okay? The problem with this exhaustion, exhaustion, exhaustion phase is it puts you at risk to get sick because your immune system is struggling to help fix the first and second, okay? So the longer you are in first stage, the more likely you are to get sick. Um, and I use this example, um, and um, one of the two Chris's, um, I, I certainly don't try to use this as experience personally, and um, but I've always used 9-11 as that 
example of, of first stage. The guys and I, the guys who worked the pile, um, uh, um, were in that first stage for a long time, and a lot of them got really, really sick. And some of it was the chemicals they were inhaling, and some of it was simply the, their immune system collapsed on them because of how long these stages lasted. Um, and um, so the door gets kicked in, fix my baby or a mass casualty. Um, I mean, that one is the nightmare of all, the nightmare of all nightmares, you know, 9-11. It could it could be a local mass casualty, you know, a, a minivan with eight people in it. You're going to struggle with that one for a little bit, stress-wise. Okay, so I want you to understand how this works, so that you can recognize it in yourself and in your coworkers that if you have that big call, and it might not be people dying, it's just high stress. Uh, it's a fire. Um, it's a coworker gets hurt or killed. That's that's the most stressful one I've been involved with. Um, I want you to Kevin, know. Yeah. If I could just kick in on that on the 9/11 yep. thing, you know, uh, that yep. was me. And we're coming up on 20 years, and uh, and I still go through it with the uh, with the PTSD stuff and all that stuff. And I did have cancer and all that stuff. So all those uh, combinations of things they 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 get to you. A little bit you know and I, I for the new people starting out if, if you're gonna notice it in other people before you notice it in yourself yeah. and um, it's it's difficult and everybody wants to be the big shot and yeah everybody says oh I put it in the back of the roller decks and I'm fine and I'm fine and I'm fine All, those, those ones of us that say that we're fine 99.9% .9 of the time we, we are so not fine so I'm, I'm glad that you touched on all that stuff. That's that's good. Thank you. Yeah, I, to me, this is one of the most important parts of this class, of the whole course, is <clears throat> physical, physiological, emotional stress and recognizing it and how to get around, how to get past it. Um, if you have this event, it lasts five minutes, it lasts two days, understand you're at risk to get sick. Go home get some sleep, um, go home, well, right from the get-go, start hydrating. Um, when you're healthy, half a gallon of water a day is what they recommend, eight eight-ounce glasses, half a gallon. When you are sick, you should double it and drink a gallon a day. You have this event, you come home and your wife's having an affair, that's an event. You come home and your house is on fire, that's an event. Your dog dies, that's an event, right? You have an event, hydrate. Take some vitamin C, help boost your immune system um, and make sure you get enough rest and know that you are at risk to get sick. This isn't even the psychological side of it, which we're going to touch on in a little bit. OK. This is just another one of the little uh, this is in, uh, I think, the AEMT book. It just it shows those stages. Um, how do we adapt? Same thing, you know, it's just another way that they word it. Um, rest and recovery. Um, we used to worry more about, well, EMS didn't really worry a lot. Police fire EMS, public safety didn't really worry a lot about the whole psychological thing because, hey, we're the, re we're the heroes. We, we, we're the rescuers. We don't need the help. That's why you have nightmares and you can't sleep and you start drinking and you start smoking and you would never ever dream of shooting up and you shoot up, okay? So psychological stress is absolutely a, a huge part of it. Um, the 22 a day, 22 veterans a day killing themselves. Um, studies over the last five or six years have shown as, as many as or more than that for police, fire, and EMS kill themselves every day. And as Chris said, you will recognize it in somebody else before you recognize it in yourself. Okay? And our world is very small. And what I mean by that is my immediate world, my home life, my work life, my play life is all interconnected. Right? 
I broke my neck in 1984 in a car accident. Bottom a mile long hill in Stratford. I was in the backseat of a car. Um, the guy cutting me out of the car was um, a first responder from Stratford. Um, and the guy using the jaws was in effect an older brother of mine. Um, not biologically, but effectively he was an older brother. And he, imagine his stress, you know, looking in the car and there I am unconscious, okay? Um, fast forward five years later, I'm a paramedic and I go to that same corner and I'm doing CPR on a dead 17 year old girl. Uh, and her boyfriend's leaning against the two tree trunks that my car made, right? It is a very small world we live in. Um, if you work in an area that you live, you are going to run into people you know who are sick or dead. Um, you are going to run into people who kn you know who think you are a shit bag and they're not gonna, you know, it's gonna create problems. It's just, it happens, all right? So watch out for yourself. And if your partner comes up to you and says, dude, what's wrong? Stop for a second and go, oh yeah, I remember Kevin and Chris saying something about that and take, and take some advice. There are people out there that will help us, okay? There's actually a place in Manchester called FORGE, and I don't remember what it stands for. Um, it's a counseling group, and it's all, they were all police, fire, and EMS at one point, and now they're psychologists. And they do specifically first responder mental health. Um, so uh, I, I looked into them for a friend of mine, and um, it's a pretty amazing program. They do a, an intensive outpatient program, just something to keep in the back of your mind if you need it or somebody else you know needs it. And it doesn't have to be because of an EMS call. It could be home life, but you are a provider. So they'll take care of you. Hey, Kevin. Now, yeah. Um, just a quick comment about that. I know every department and agency and everybody does things differently. Even crew on certain shifts do doing things differently, but I served a couple of years down in New York City on a volunteer ambulance in an agency down there. And every code three call that we went to, there was yeah. like a mandatory policy when we got back to quarters that everybody talked it through. We talked about protocols, we talked about what we did, what we didn't do, what we could have done better. But more importantly, it was like really just to focus in on making sure everybody was good, making sure everybody, you know, could voice any opinion or any, you know, concerns or like out that they were upset by what they saw and like talk that through. And I think the benefits and positives that we saw by doing that sort of thing on those serious calls really helped kind of decrease that coping time that everybody would have gone through on their own just by kind of like building that camaraderie around, you know, we all saw it, we all know it was pretty messed up and, you know, you don't have to think about it alone forever. That, that's a phenomenal system. Um, and that's, that's recommended very few of our, I mean, so what I recommend to people is talk about it on the way back with your partner. Hey, what happened? What went on? What could we do better? And you're kind of feeling each other out at the same time to see how they're responding to it. Um, and if you can do that with a, a system, that would be lovely. Um, hi, yeah, that, um, they're in the top 5% nationwide that system is my guess, just because they do that. They, they probably do everything else pretty well too. Yeah, it was a, it's like a 3,500 call per year department. There were three buses that were just constantly out and crazy stuff. So yeah. it was a, there were lots of crews on. Nice. Um, so as we go through this, there's gonna be other suggestions that you know we're gonna see. Um, we're gonna go about five minutes and we'll take our 10 minute break. Um, so cumulative stress, little things that happen repeatedly. Um, I used an example of one of the ER docs I used to work with who constantly clicked his pen when he was stressed and that made everybody around him stressed. And then one time, one of our nurses, a lovely person, very quiet, you know, she turned, will you stop that? in pen and it just it took everybody by surprise including him he didn't realize he was doing it and he stressed everybody out around him um so cumulative at some point you snap 
Um, hopefully it's just yelling at somebody, not going up on the clock tower with a rifle. Um, so signs and symptoms, physically, um, we have nausea, vomiting, tremors, shaking. You don't feel very coordinated. You have trouble walking, doing things, profuse sweating. These are not, so acute stress. This is not, this is like the worst. If you have everything on this list, this is absolutely the worst stress reaction on the planet. Um, and I want you to think about people in the future when you take care of somebody having an anxiety attack. This is what they're feeling. Every little stressor makes them as if they were on a plane crash every time, okay? Um, cognitively, confusion, concentration. Um, they don't remember things that happened during the event. Uh, disoriented, emotionally anxious, denial, didn't happen, or I'm fine. Um, panicky, fear, scared, anger, numb. Um, behaviorally, we see this in our partners, um, certainly before they do. Um, they just stop doing things that they always were doing. Um, I had uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago now, my wife and I went through a tough time and um, she was going to leave me. I didn't know it. <laughs> and uh, the day I found out, I, you know, I walked into work the next day and um, everybody picked up on it immediately because I just, I walked into the ER, I sat down at one of the computers and I just didn't talk to anybody, you know. Um, uh, actually, my inappropriate humor probably got better because I just didn't talk to anybody. So I wasn't telling naughty jokes. Um, suspiciousness, you know, everything she's doing, you know, right. Um, change in appetite, risky behaviors, smoking drugs, um, um, risky sex, all those things. So when these stressors continue, we get exhausted, we get burned out, and we just shut down. Um, so if you can recognize these signs in your partners early, hopefully you can intervene. Now, there's a question, I think it's in one of the books that talks about, you notice your partner's smoking more. And you've talked to them about, uh, you know, how long you wait a week or two to talk to them about it. Um, what can you do to help talk to them about the dangers of smoking? I personally, I would be more concerned with the why has he picked up smoking again or why is he smoking more now? And I would take that. I'd, I'd look more into it as a stress. Um, denial. Acting out trivializing. Um, so in EMF, in public safety, we tell dark jokes and we make jokes all the time about things that are inappropriate. We're trivial, trivializing them. Um, it's a way that we do um, kind of cope with things. Appropriate, not appropriate? I, I, I don't know. If it's As long as it's not getting away from you or becoming completely inappropriate, or you're doing it in front of people that it, it's inappropriate to do it in front of, it's not that big a deal. Um, placing blame on something else or somebody else, um, right? So these charts are in both books, workaholism or escapism, right? You're escaping from what's tr what's troubling you. Um, you're banging out of work because you don't want to go back to work. Stress at work is what's getting you. Um, or you're taking all the overtime you get your hands on because you're escaping home life. Okay. Um, suppressing it. These are the things, right? Kind of that stereotypical laying on the couch, talking to a psychiatrist. Um, they're trying to get you to bring those things out and talk about them. Okay. Um, we're halfway through the slides. So it was a long, <laughs> My eyes did that too. Uh, this is a long, uh, a long night worth of slides. <clears throat> All right. Now, stressors, work hours, workload, pay. Um, that's any place. That's not just EMS though. I mean, you know, that's a, you know, Friday night after the local high school football game, if you work at McDonald's, guess what? You're going to have some some workload, okay? 
conflicts, coworkers, supervisors, everybody. Um, you're driving with your lights and siren on and people aren't hearing you, they're not pulling over. Um, confrontational patients, difficult patients. And that could be difficult, not intentionally. You know, a person's had a stroke and they just, they can't help you do anything and they can't communicate with you. Um, that's a difficult patient, um, much less the guy who's, you know, barking at you, yelling at you. I didn't call, I don't want you here, whatever. Um, and this decision-making mistakes, you know, the fear of that, um, that goes, that gets less with confidence. Confidence comes with, um, you know, experience. But it also comes with knowledge. You know, if you know at the end of this, you know you did just enough to pass, right? I need a 70 on the registry, and that's all I care about. Then your confidence might at some point start to say to you, say to you, you know, that means three patients out of 10, you're gonna screw up. Right? So the harder you work at this, the more knowledge you pull from it the smarter you are at the end, uh, the more confident you should be. Um, dead or dying patients. We are, our society is not used to seeing dead people unless you're at a funeral, right? You walk in, they've been made all kinds of pretty, they've got dresses and suits and uniforms on, and they don't look real. You know, they're, they got that waxy embalmed look. We're walking in and grandma's dead in her bed right or the wife is dead in bed or she's pitched over in the bathroom and dead um um rotting literally decomposed or, i mean just all kinds of, we see this on a on kind of a regular basis um dying patients um abuse and neglect <clears throat> we see this thank god i do not work in an area where we see it every day, because this would be probably the, this would, this probably would have ended my career. If I had to take care of child abuse um, or a, elderly abuse every day, that probably would be enough that I'd be done because I, I'd be killing people. And um, you can't do that. You know, you can't be judgmental. You can't be confrontational at these events because it can affect your access to those patients who need your help the most. So um, th that would be kind of, mm. kids. Um, I've been blessed in that when I take care of a kid, I can look at that patient and say to myself, it's not my son, it's not my daughter. Um, and some people can't do that. They, they look at this patient and all they can picture is their son or daughter. So I, I'm, I've been blessed that way. I've taken care of a lot of sick, injured kids um and and i can do that um, hey kevin yeah i've been so i've been on the fire department now for 10 years and i've responded to a to you know quite a few calls and i've had a couple where they have involved young people mm -hmm. and uh you know it just makes me come home and hug my kids Yep. A little bit harder that day. Yep, absolutely. Um, Kevin, I was on a call about a week and a half ago, fatal MBA with a seven-year-old kid that was out in the road, and he had the same name as me, and that one's still following me around. Oh, uh, dude, yeah. I, whew. Yeah, it was, it was weird. We, he, we got him to the hospital fine, but dad passed away from a brain aneurysm before they hit the tree. Yeah, that's ugly. Yeah, um, not not pretty. No, that's a uh, that's actually a new one. I mean, for me, um, I, it hasn't happened to me, and I haven't heard of others with it. And and Liam isn't exactly a common New Hampshire name either. No, I I like bent down and I said, "Hey, buddy, how you doing?" He's like, "Okay, I'm a little scared." I said, "What's your name?" He said, "Liam," and I almost passed out. I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" It was like um, this weird weird flash type thing. Dude, there was a reason you were there. Yeah. To make that kid feel better. I, I, I think whether it's karma or religion or whatever you want to think, I think that 
sometimes we end up being the truck someplace for a reason. Yeah, and, uh, for sure. And I would, I would, I would take it that way if I were you. You know, so. Huh. That's all fate. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Absolutely believe in that. Yeah. Um, mass casualty certainly a tough one. Um, <clears throat> and if you think mass casualty can't happen around here, tour buses, minivans, school trips, um, you know, whatever, uh, it can happen. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine opening the back door of a of a um, U-Haul and finding 65 immigrants. And it happens, you know, I, whew, holy crap, you know, so um, that, that would be ugly. Uh, injury or death of a coworker. Uh, 1993 Halloween, uh, not Halloween, sorry, Thanksgiving weekend, um, we lost a helicopter in Maine. And well, we didn't lose it, we know where it went. Um, but uh, it had a, a, a flight medic and a flight nurse, and the flight nurse was somebody well known throughout. Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, um, patient and the pilot. And the only survivor was a pilot. Um, that was crushing to New England EMS for a long time, crushing. Um, I think there were 5,000 people at the, at the memorial service in Portland, um, crushing. Um, and that took a while. That's, the, that's one of two things I've had in my life work-wise that have bothered me. And I say two things. I look at this in a couple of ways. <clears throat> One is my religious beliefs allow me to feel that if I, and this is key though, if I have done everything I can do for that patient, if I have done everything I can do for that patient, somebody else has bigger plans, whether it be God, Allah, Buddha, Satan, whatever their entity is. If I have screwed something up, then I should feel bad about it, okay? Um, Again, the regular patients, I try to do everything right. Um, and I don't take, if I've done everything right, that I, that's just the way I feel about it. Um, you know, there's timing for everything. Um, and, uh, but um, Dawn and Matt, the, the, pilot, the medic and the nurse bothered me. Um, and that girl in Stratford bothered me. Um, Cause you know, it was right there. It was right in the same place I almost died. And the uh, EMT from Stratford doing chest compressions for me was the minister who cut me, who cut the trees away from my car with his chainsaw. So, yeah, that was tough. Um, so those are the tough ones. Traumatic injuries. In, so, again, this is how my brain works. Cool. Yeah. Yesterday, uh, two days ago, femur sticking out, blue jeans stuck in the hole. Um, mush leg. Cool, right? I'm a little twisted. Um, but not everybody gets that way. I know some really good ER nurses. Once the patient is declared dead in their room, they will not go back in that room again because they're dead. I, I don't do dead people well. You were in there for 45 minutes, but they weren't dead yet. Oh, they were dead. They were, they just weren't legally dead, you know? So different people do things, handle things differently. Um, so handling stress, <clears throat> talk it out, talk with your partners, talk with your crews. Um, my wife used to get mad at me because I wouldn't talk to her about work. I come home, I don't wanna talk about work. Well, she's an ER nurse and a nursing supervisor. And she's a woman. She loves to talk about this stuff. <sighs> That's something I had to learn how to do. Um, but talk to people. And if talking to people doesn't help, talk to somebody else, like somebody with another license, like psychologist. Go get some help. Get some mental health help, uh, help for yourself. Um, eat better. Drop the caffeine. Um, drop the sweets. Exercise a little bit. Do not drink to excess. People say, oh, don't drink at all. Eh, you're going to have a beer or two. That's okay. Don't drink to excess. Okay. Um, after this accident with the girl, I took three days off. And my coworkers were shocked because they'd never seen anything affect me. 
I said, yeah, I'm out. I'm out. And for three days, I rode my mountain bike around Pittsfield. I was living there at the time. And basically, I rode down to the creek, the river that runs through town. And I sat there with a fishing rod. And I, I, I relived my accident and her call. And I'd ride my mountain bike for a little bit. And I'd go up to the corner store and I'd get a wine cooler because I'm kind of a sissy. I like wine coolers. And one wine cooler would fit in my water bottle on my bicycle. I go back down. I, I three or four of them a day, right? So it's certainly not to excess. But I had to ride my bicycle to go get it. And I took my mind off at fishing, and I got through it. Okay. Um, with my wife, I couldn't get through it alone. I I had to, I went to my PCP and I got some chemical help. And I went to counseling and I got some emotional help. Okay. Highly recommend it. If you can't fix yourself, you got to get somebody who can help you fix you. Now, we see this from our patients and from their families. Um, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, Psych 101, high school psychology. Denial. It's not me. Can't happen to me. Um, you know, um, anger. Why me? Bargaining. Okay, well, you know, God, if you, you know, help me out with this, I'll go to church, right? I'll be a better husband. I'll be whatever. Um, and this isn't just death and dying either. You know, ah, oh, my wife's going to leave me. No. Why me? Hey, God, right? So this is stages of death, dying, and just emotional distress. Depression. You just can't get yourself out of it. Um, I didn't eat in 30 days, literally. I could not eat. Um, I was drinking a, one protein shake a day when my wife and I had that event. I lost 40 pounds in 30 days. Not a healthy way to lose weight. Okay. It came right back on too. And then finally you accept it and you go, okay, I can deal with this. There's a great movie. It's a Burt Reynolds movie from, I think, 1980 called The End. If you watch anything this week or weekend on, on a movie, try to find that movie. It is funniest damn movie you'll ever watch it's and it's burt reynolds finding out he has a terminal disease and he goes all in and out and through these five stages and it is just absolutely the funniest thing ever and once you know what these stages are then you can pick them out in the movie um and once you know what they are you can pick them out with your patients too and your family dealing with them golden rule treat other people the way you want to be treated that's patients that's family that's friends that's co-workers recognize that they have some additional needs um it, and it might just be they want to hold your hand and cry i do that i will sit on a couch with my arm around somebody holding her hand and let her just sob hysterically on my shoulder um and i guarantee i'm crying too okay um i've had a lot of partners who don't do that well we walk in, her husband's dead in bed. He didn't wake up in the morning, and they're out. They're going to go sit outside and wait for the cops to show up, and I'm the one inside. Um, it's hard to do, you know, take their hand, walk them back into that bedroom and say, give him a hug and kiss. Tell him you love him, right, because that goes a long ways. I do that when I'm working a code, too. Um, if we're doing CPR, I tell them, hey, hearing's the last thing to go. I don't know if they can hear you or not. I'd like to think they can. You want to give them a hug and kiss and tell them you love them, this would be a good time. And it freaks out partners. But I do it because that is a need that they have, right? How many people later in life go, oh, if only I could have told them I loved them. If only I could have said goodbye. Give your patients, families that, that chance, all right? If they bark at you, understand it's nothing personal. Um, you know, it's like Roadhouse, right? It's not, it's nothing personal. They yell at you. It's nothing personal, right? Don't strike back verbally or physically. Defend yourself physically, but don't strike back, right? Um, be empathetical. Um, you can't, if you look at some, don't ever lie to somebody. Um, if you look at somebody and you go, I know, I, I know how you feel. They're going to look at you and go, no, you don't. I, I, I've been married to him for 52 years. How do you know how I feel? Now, you may have just lost a husband or a wife. They don't know that. And you can tell them, well, you know, my wife just died. and um, But yeah, but we were together 52. You don't know how I feel. 
So empathy is, um, you know, I, I can't imagine how you feel. I'm really sorry for what happened. What can I do to help you? That's empathy, okay? Um, and you didn't lie to them. You didn't mean to lie to them in the first place, but they take it as a lie. Um, do not falsely reassure people. I've heard this line, I can't tell you how many times. Um, don't worry, nobody dies in my ambulance. <laughs> yeah, they do. And people say, no, they don't, because we don't pronounce them. A dead is dead. A, a piece of paper and a time on that is not dead. Their heart stops, their, their soul leaves the building, right? They're dead. Um, and that happens in our trucks. And I hear people say, that, oh, is he, gonna, is he gonna be all right? He'll be fine, we'll get him to the hospital, he'll be fine. You don't know that. So don't lie to him. I, you know, if, if, I'm looking, if I'm looking at him and I know they're gonna be fine, you know, they got a cut and they need two stitches. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna be fine. He's gonna get a couple of stitches. He'll see you tonight, you know, come into the ER, but wait in the car. Um, and if I don't know though, if I'm, if I'm thinking he's not gonna make the ride, I'll look at, I'll be honest with you, ma'am, I, I don't know how this is gonna turn out. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure he's okay though. Um, you wanna give him a hug and kiss before we leave? <laughs> Now's a good time, okay? Um, offer as much comfort as you can. Mental health personnel um, absolutely play a part in this. And what what EMS experts recommend and what I recommend is that you get mental health experts who were public safety providers. So like in New Hampshire, there's um, a um, CISD team, critical incident stress debriefing team out in Nashua. They are all current or former police, fire, EMS, and nurses. Exeter Hospital, we had a really bad call one night. Um, burn patient into the ER, got fl um, uh, nobody was flying, shipped out by ambulance. And um, they called in the hospital's um, psychologist who does the um, employee assistance program. And she's wonderful. I, I went to her with this issue of my wife. She's wonderful for that. But partway through talking with the ER staff and the ambulance crew about this burn patient, she started crying and went, oh my God, I don't know how you people can handle this. What kind of help is that? So you need to go to somebody who can help you, okay? Um, that's why I think finding out about this forge group is it was a, a good thing um, for me. Um, we need to come up with effective coping strategies, right? You can look in your book for that, exercise, all that stuff, right? Um, mature mechanisms, um, distracting yourself with other things takes that. In fact, I did, I did a project for my psychology class last semester. Would outdoor activities like hiking, camping, fishing, hunting, shooting sports help soldiers with PTSD? And overwhelmingly, the answer to that was yes. Some of it was distraction. The more you can take your mind off one of these events and replace it with good memories, helps. Um, they start to look forward to this next event, which releases dopamine, which is the feel-good chemical. So you had a really good time canoeing and camping. And oh man, I felt really good for those two days. I didn't lay around the house depressed and smoking dope and shit, right? I felt great. Oh, the next trip's in two weeks and you start looking forward to it and it helps. So things like that will help us as well, okay? Uh, we beat this one up. Um, but if you're a little overweight, if you drop 15 pounds, your patient weighs 15 pounds less, basically because you're carrying 15 pounds less down the stairs, okay? Um, and the healthier you are physically, the healthier you can remain emotionally. Some of the things that are specific for us, motor vehicle collisions, that's the number one cause of um, death in EMS, but back injuries are the number one cause of, um, of injuries, of, of debilitating injury um, and time lost at work. Some strength, some core strength activities, sit-ups, push-ups. Um, 
leaning against a, one of those big inflatable balls against the wall and then going down to a squat position and going up. Um, these are all things I was taught after one of my bad back injuries. And you know what? It turns out that um, since I lost that 150 pounds, hmm, my back doesn't hurt as much. Imagine that. Um, we are we are exposed to violence. It's a rarity, but it is out there and the potential is there. Um, it's kind of funny. Our career field, we are potentially exposed to violence, but if we know it's if we know it's there or could be there, we are encouraged to stay back and let somebody else expose himself and take a bullet for us. That police officer, right? Um, the fire guys go into burning buildings and take that bullet for us. And we kind of just sit around the corner and go, okay, tell us when it's safe. But at any time we could be attacked. Um, you need to be aware of that. Uh, and certainly COVID has made us um, very aware of communicable diseases, but hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hep C, tuberculosis, uh, the common cold, pneumonias, et cetera. Those are all things that could get us. So we'll talk about PPE in a little bit. Our immune system is very, um, whoops, is very dependent on our sleep-wake cycle. Our immune system does not do well with a chronic sleep deprivation. And that could be just crappy sleep, like maybe you need CPAP, maybe you need to lose 20 pounds, maybe you need to have your adenoids removed, or it could be the fact that I do 72 hours a week. I work with a lot of people at Action who do 324s. They do them in a row. They do 72 straight. Yeah, you, you can't, everybody else is going out too. Our radios and open frequency for Carroll County. Wakefield goes out, Tufton Borough goes out, the other trucks go out. You can't sleep well in that environment. Our immune system struggles, okay? So that puts us at risk for all those illness and injuries too. Um, healthy food. The best piece of advice I've ever heard from several different, um, both from nutritionists and from like, um, some of these weightlifters and just general health people is when you go shopping, shop the outside walls of the supermarket. That's where the fresh food is. Frozen fresh food or just regular fresh you know, vegetables, um, the fresh meats, the fresh uh, chicken, whatever it is. What is in the aisles is processed product. All kinds of bad chemicals in it, right? Um, one of the guys that I, I follow uh, on a social net media says, uh, the middle aisles, you just dive in there real quick for like salt, pepper, and coffee, and then get the hell out. But where do we shop on shift? Oh, Circle K at the Irving. Um, oh, we go to Subway. Subway, as it turns out, is probably our best choice, right? Um, decent portion control, fairly fresh food. Um, it's probably our healthiest choice compared to McDonald's and Burger King and you know Irving, dear God. We also sit on our butts at work for a long time, right? What do we do? We watch video games, play video games, watch movies, right? I mean, if you've got a high-tech video game chair and a high-tech set of earphones, dude, you probably have a little bit of a sedentary issue going on. I go to the gym every day. <laughs> I mean, you are in better shape than me. All right. so. Um, everything in moderation, right? Death and uh, severe injury and death on duty personnel's motor vehicle accident. Um, Google ambulance accident reports. You'll see just some horrific things. I've got one that, that I do in a refresher. It's 10 pages long. That 10 pages lists the injuries of the paramedic in the back of the ambulance. 10 pages. He went flying. The monitor went flying, crushed his thorax, drove his breastbone, his sternum, into his heart, into his um, spine, and snapped his spine. Uh, the patient then left the stretcher, because um, it wasn't strapped down with shoulder straps, slammed into him and the monitor, and then the stretcher ripped loose and slammed into all of them. And then he, he was on the bottom of the pile in the door well. 
awful stuff. And it's not just other drivers doing it. We have 20 year old EMTs driving for us, whether I'm a medic or you're the one in back, and they have medical crises. They pass out, their blood sugars drop, they, um, they have a seizure, whatever it is, and they veer into oncoming traffic in front of the lumber truck. It happens. We have to lift patients safely, lift equipment safely, use the right equipment, and use proper mechanics. And it, w this is better gone over next week. So Tuesday night, we'll do a quiz on these chapters when we first get there. I will not put anything in there about specific lifting mechanisms, whatnot. I won't do that because we're going to go over that Tuesday night. Everything else is fair game, though. Excuse me. We certainly go to places where there can be injury and violence. Um, our safety comes first. It is perfectly acceptable for us to run away like screaming little kids um, if we feel unsafe. Um, we are not abandoning our patients if we feel unsafe. Um, if we know there's a house where there's this violence, we don't have to go into it until the police go there, okay? Scene size up. <clears throat> what am I walking into? Um, are the stairs falling apart? Is there a dog fence, you know, a dog run, a fenced in dog run outside, and the fencing is 10 feet tall, and the dog chain is that big around, and the dog's inside. Not going. <laughs> oh, he doesn't bite. He's the size of a horse, he bites, okay? Um, making sure we can get in a place safely. Um, making sure, don't park on ice so that when, I step out of the truck, hit the ice, I land underneath the ambulance, staring at the muffler. It's happened to me, okay? Um, recognize when you're safe and recognize when you might not be safe. Um, infectious illness, right? We have um, bacteria, we have viruses, I think we all know that one by now, and then we have this nasty thing called fungus. My favorite, one of my favorite foods is a fungus called mushrooms. Um, think about having fungal pneumonia. That's a thing. Basically, you have mushrooms growing in your lungs. Not healthy. Very hard to kill. Um, okay. communicable, communicable diseases. Diseases that can be passed from one person to another and have an effect on their health. Pathogens, anything that can make you sick, right? Whether it be virus. Back, uh, bacteria or um, fungus. Now in the books, we have all these nice little charts. Um, HIV, so here's the thing with HIV. Back when it came out, we as a, as a, as a world were concerned it was the end of the world. Um, there was nothing that could prevent the stop of this other than refraining from risky behavior. You, you, you can't stop that stuff, um, whether it's um, sexual contact or whether it's the needles and stuff. Um, it, and then it, you know, it gets passed from males to females fairly easily um, because of microscopic tears that occur in the females during sexual activity. Um, it's hard to pass it from women to men, though, because men anatomically are a little different. If you don't know that, please Google it later. Um, but we don't we don't suffer those microscopic tears through regular intercourse, much less um, um, the higher risk rectal stuff. So, um, but we did we thought it was the world's coming to an end. And here's where we are, thirty something years later, is that um, we have an uh, we have antiviral medications geared at HIV. That um, there's been some reports of people being cured from it. If you become HIV positive and you be, you go on those antivirals, you will not convert to AIDS. At AIDS, so like untreated HIV, you have like uh, four decent years of health. Four, while your immune system is destroying itself. And then you have one, you convert to AIDS, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, and you have one really, really bad year and then you die. With HIV now, with the antivirals, they're saying you won't convert to AIDS. Um, and some of the, Magic Johnson was one of the first ones who was reporting zero HIV findings 
after many, many years of the, the meds. Um, if you convert to AIDS and that's how they find out and you go on the antivirals, you're going to have four or five decent years before you have one bad one and die. So the antiviral meds for HIV, strongly recommend them. Um, if you have an exposure that you feel is high risk, personal or on the job, you can go get those antivirals and go on them. Um, recommend them. Antiviral meds, by the way, have some kind of nasty side effects. Uh, make you feel like sometimes like you get the flu, um, but <clears throat> uh, I think it's well worth it. Uh, hep B and C, uh, liver problems. Um, hepatitis B vaccine is great. Hepatitis B is the um, easiest. Sorry, somebody just pulled into my yard. I've got a gate and a no trespassing sign. Um, it's one of the easiest things to um, catch, but we've got a um, a vaccine, which is lovely. Hep C is harder to catch, no vaccine. Hep A is fecal oral exposure. Um, I also think of it as the um, um, Taco Bell disease, because if you Google Taco Bell and hepatitis A, you'll come up with about 800 million hits. Um, that's kind of ugly. Um, my gate's opening. Hmm, that means somebody with code is coming in. Um, Sorry to be distracted so easily. I had somebody try to come across my lawn last night while I was sitting here on the porch. No idea what he wanted, but he wanted to come up to the deck and I was like, no. Said, you know, trespassing sign, get it. And uh, I had to warn him off. Anyways, um, so tuberculosis, we have uh, vaccines for that as well. Bacterial meningitis. Meningitis is ugly. You can come on by. Um, it can be viral or bacterial. Viral is scarier because it's not as easily taken care of. If you've got a patient who cannot touch their chin to their chest without screaming and they've got a high fever, you better have your big PPE on. All masks, gowns, gloves, everything. Um, it's highly contagious. Um, pneumonia, like I said, fungal. Ugh. Um, skin infections. Um, skin infections are kind of ugly too because um, they're one of the common causes of that is what we call MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aurealis. And um, we're running out of antibiotics that will kill MRSA. Um, and it's a very common skin, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, infection. <clears throat> um, right now, or a year or two ago, new antibiotics, there was only one being tested in the US. Um, and so when MRSA finally developed, because MRSA will clone itself and mutate like COVID is, when MRSA finally wipes, you know, comes up immune to all of the antibiotics, we're screwed. Um, whether it be skin infections, um, respiratory infections, urinary tract, whatever. Uh, influenza, the flu. I think um, between COVID and the flu in the last year and a half, we've covered that. Hey, somebody tell me why flu infections um, basically dropped to zero in the last year and a half. Because people were wearing masks and more conscious of washing their hands? Yep. We learned oral nasal um um, blockade techniques, and we learn how to wash our hands again. Uh, amazing. Um, what we did see in the, uh, um, however, in the ERs was a super high rate of strep throat. And one of the PAs that was telling me about that said she couldn't figure, she looked all kinds of stuff up. And I, I just looked at her and said, I think that's common sense. People are wearing the same cloth masks day after day after day and they're not washing them. You're supposed to wear a cloth mask for a day and then wash it. Um, he said, so the germs, you know, you pick up strep from someplace and you exhale it into the mask and then you inhale it and exhale it. And you're making this warm, moist environment that strep loves and it, a lot of really ugly strep throat. So our PPE can help us, but if we don't take appropriate care with it, it can hurt us too. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Yo. What about any findings on um, CO2 with, with masks? Yeah, great question. So I was concerned about that. And um, um, I took a, um, a RAD 57. Um, oh, I, no, not the RAD 57, I'm sorry. The end tidal CO2, geez, I'm confusing my equipment. If I put an end tidal CO2 monitor in my nose and um, I walked around and uh, nothing happened no change at all uh and i was at work and i'm a couple of hours and uh nothing not at all so yeah i wouldn't worry about that <clears throat> excuse me great question though german measles um rubella basically we've wiped it out because when we're kids we get um mmr measles mumps and rubella um here's the funny thing in 2008 so i don't know i was in my 30s um 40s jesus 40s um i went to work at exeter hospital and they did titers to check my levels and i was not immune to rubella at that point so they gave me a new mmr and i'm fine again you know so i, I it's great if you go to work someplace they're supposed to check you out for this stuff a lot of services don't do that though they don't do any sort of physical exam ahead of time um pertussis which is whooping cough <clears throat> which is not what I have, I have allergies, um, <clears throat> is ugly. Adults get sick with it. We get um, this horrific sounding cough. Our throats get really raw from the cough <clears throat> and we get fevers. It is very contagious. And the problem is that we are contagious many days before we become symptomatic. Pertussis kills kids. I'm not talking like, Oh, it kills one in a hundred. I'm talking pertussis mortality rates in kids are double digits. I don't know specifically, but I mean, I've heard 20, 30, 40%, depending on, you know, different places I've read it, um, which means your kids or your grandkids or your whatever, your patients. Um, so <clears throat> anytime somebody's got a cough, I mean, we know this now with, with COVID, hopefully everybody's wearing masks when they do patient care, but I see a lot of people don't put masks on uh, in on ambulance calls. In the ERs, they have to, because it's it's hospital policy. You will wear a mask from the second you step in here. Um, if we ever get back to a point where we're not wearing masks all the time with patient care, anybody with a cough, put a mask on. Put a mask on you, put a mask on them. <clears throat> SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. This was one of those um, <clears throat> H1N1 type flus that, that we had a breakout in 2003. Um, at, I was at Frisbee then and we had a big meeting on how we were gonna handle this. Every hospital had these big meetings. Um, and so the thing that stands out in my mind most about those meetings was we took basically building a building map of, of the facility and tried to figure out what doctor's office we were gonna use to store all the bodies. We, we had a small morgue that would hold two people in the refrigerator. We were expecting hundreds a day to die from this because that's what was happening in Singapore. And it was so contagious, right? Some guy gets, off a plane, gets on a plane in Singapore, felt fine, gets off in Toronto and the whole plane was affected by it. So um, that kind of thing, the flu of 1918 killed something like 100 million people around the world, 100 million. 10 million in the US died. Our population was 110 million. That's almost 10% of our population died from that. Um, SARS scared them more. And that's why, you know, with COVID, they went they went way crazy way late in my in my opinion um they should have jumped on it sooner um and if they had they wouldn't have had to shut everything down like they did but um because they didn't jump on it sooner we had to go way overboard to try to play catch up okay. and it's because of the flu and sars <clears throat> direct transmission <clears throat> I cough in your face. Indirect, uh, well, 
but so direct can be respiratory. Um, direct can be bloodborne also. Um, indirect is could be either. Um, you touch a surface and then put food in your mouth, you've infected yourself. You take your taco from Taco Bell. The guy who's got hepatitis just uh, had a bowel movement, did not wash his hands, made your taco. You eat your taco, you have hepatitis A. It's indirect. You do something naughty with the Taco Bell guy, that's direct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Virulence and dose. So virulence is the strength of said germ, bacteria, virus, whatever. And the dose is how much of it you got. Um, so how do we control against this? Well, classes, policies, engineering. What do we have for equipment? What do we have for, um, within our engineering, what do they get us for PPE, personal protective equipment? Right. What kind of masks do we have? What kind of gowns do we have? Right now, the gloves that we're getting in EMS suck because they're just people are making gloves now who never made them before. Um, they're not making them as thick as they used to because they just don't have the material there. You know, we we had shortages for a long time. I mean, if you think about last April, a year ago, April, um, masks, gowns, gloves, hospitals were running out. They were, I mean, we were reusing masks that we never should have reused. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Again, we come back to this. If you're basically healthy, your body should be able to fight this easier. This is what scares me about COVID. The young guys, like if you're a Red Sox fan, then you know, you know, the pitcher from last year who got, who got myocarditis um, <clears throat> from COVID. Young, healthy athlete. His 25 million a year did not protect him. Okay. Um, yes, the majority, especially in New Hampshire, the majority of the dead from COVID were over the age of 60. The ones that were close to 60 had other health issues, but there were people who died who had no comorbidities. <clears throat> Get your shots, wash your hands. Um, alcohol foam cleaner is great. You can have it in a bag with you. You can have it in the front seat of your ambulance with you. You can have it in your truck with you. I have some fairly smelly crap in my pickup truck. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I keep a box of gloves in my truck. When I pump gas, <clears throat> excuse me, I put a glove on just because that handle has been touched by a billion people today. <clears throat> and and I wash my hands a lot now. Now, sharps, which are needles, they need to go into sharps boxes. Um, back in the day when I started out, we used to take our needles and stick them in the um, bench seat next to us. You might have 10 stuck there by the end of the day. Those mattresses were just petri dishes of, of infection. Ugh. Do not hand a needle to somebody else to get rid of for you. That's how people get poked by accident. <clears throat> if you use a needle for anything, an EpiPen, um, to do a finger stick for blood sugar, to do an IV, you put that needle away. <clears throat> We're on a call and I say to you, I start, I start an IV and it's a safety needle. I go, hey, it's a safe needle. It's all, can you throw this away for me? Say, nope, don't, don't let me do that, okay? <clears throat> now, standard precautions is a term that says everybody's infected with something, blood or body fluids, <clears throat> respiratory fluids. Um, with hepatitis and HIV, it's protein-based body fluids. So it's gotta have either blood or reproductive fluids. To, it's gotta have protein in it, okay? You do not get HIV from somebody coughing in your face. You can get hepatitis from that, you can get pneumonia, you can get TB, you can get COVID. <clears throat> Gloves are probably the most used. Um, most of us didn't start wearing masks on a regular basis until COVID. We do not need to wear sterile gloves for patient care. Now, this, just a couple of quick slides on how to um, take one off. <clears throat> now, you've worn a glove for a reason. You assume your patient is nasty whether it's blood or whatever, right? P. Um, if you just take your glove off like you would take 
your winter glove off, you're going to get that on your hands or on your, on your, you know, don't take a glove and, you know, pull it off with your teeth, God almighty. Um, oops, wrong direction, sorry. So grip underneath, so with your fingers, come in underneath from the palm, hook on it, pull it out, pull it off inside out. Now you're gonna ball it up inside of your gloved hand, reach inside, pull out, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna make that glove inside out and have your trash in that one. And then most gloves can go in a regular trash can or regular trash bag. If they're contaminated with blood, it goes in a red bag. <clears throat> Don't throw everything in red bags, by the way. It's something like, uh, well, a couple of years ago, it's probably more now. A couple of years ago, the red bags cost um, $150 a pound to get rid of. You throw a wet blanket in there, you just cost your your office or your hospital or the other hospital, you know, 600 bucks just to get rid of a blanket. Um, <clears throat> 20 to 30 seconds to wash your hands. You know, happy birthday to me if you want, whatever. Um, but 20 to 30 seconds, wash your hands. Soap and water is the best. Alcohol foam cleaner is nice, but if you look on it, it will tell you if your hand is grossly contaminated, you need to use soap and water first because the alcohol will just smear it around. Single most important method for reducing the spread of disease. Um, keep your nails trimmed and clean. Most hospitals now have a policy that you cannot have fake nails because fake nails do not, you can't clean out underneath them. They all have little microscopic channels um, where, I mean, they're glued down, but there's channels there and you can't get those cleaned out. So <clears throat> your nail bed or that space between your nail and the fake nail becomes a horrific um, Petri dish. Um, don't chew your fingernails. That should go out saying. Um, jewelry, be careful with jewelry. Wear watches that you can take off and wash. You can get wet soap and water. Um, Velcro bands are, eh, Velcro bands you got to be really careful with because you got to do a good job cleaning those. Anytime you get near somebody's face, um, mask and goggles or mask and some sort of eye protection so that you don't end up um, <clears throat> being infected. You know, a lung full of their lung full is kind of ugly. Um, sharps, so that red box with the clear cover is a sharps box. You can get rid of that in there. Um, gowns, gowns are nice. Uh, in the hospital, you see them wear a lot of times these, they're typically yellow. They're Gore-Tex, literally they're Gore-Tex gowns. Um, and they'll wear one with a patient and then they put it in the hamper to get washed. <clears throat> in EMS, we tend to use these blue, very thin plastic ones, and they actually do a very good job. <clears throat> the thing I like about them is they're only about um, this big, about the size of an index card, and I can put one in my pocket. Um, during the winter, I keep one in my coat pocket. And uh, um, until COVID, I used to keep one in my pants pocket, but now we just, we have them everywhere, so. Uh, it's nice to have one with you. <clears throat> if you get product of some sort in your eyes, mouth, or nose, rinse your mouth out. Um, flushing your nose is a little hard, but um, you can do that with uh, like saline rinse, water. Um, eyes, you need to have your eyes rinsed out. Um, your eyes, so your mouth and nose, that pink wet material is called mucosa, and it is much thinner than your skin. But that mucosa that's under your eyelid, as well as your eye itself, is super thin. And it will, um, bacteria will cross that path very quickly. So you need to get um, irrigated out uh, as quickly as you can. So we need to get rid of disposable things. We need to clean the things that aren't disposable. Um, most uh, services have buckets of some sort of approved product, whether it be a, uh, kind of a, a bleach um, or some other sort of chemical cleaner. Um, wear your gloves when you um, use all that stuff because it's harsh for the skin. Some of the stuff can be um, disinfected where you wipe it down. Some of it has to be sterilized. Hospitals tend to have more sterilized things that we than we do. Like some of the things I use um, 
to put a tube in somebody's lungs, um, the hospital will send out and get sterilized. EMS just throws it away now and we get replaced. I have a promise for you. And that promise is that all, not all nights will be as long and as um, busy as this one is. Okay, so this is not a typical uh, class night. We just, we had a lot to cover uh, this first week and this is all kind of one-on-one -on -one stuff. So um, especially when we get into the hard stuff, um, we will go a lot slower, okay? <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so lack of sleep, we've talked about um, you fall asleep in the truck and you can kill yourself, you can kill your partner, fall asleep on the way home, whatever, okay? Um, and you also don't make very good decisions. Um, there's been a bunch of studies of ALS systems, so advanced life support systems, uh, specifically medic systems that um, find that there's no ALS after midnight. In busy systems, these, guys, these folks are so tired, um, they're just kind of doing the minimal work to get the patient to the hospital and try to get a little bit of sleep because they're exhausted um, and or not making good decisions. So um, yeah, pretty ugly. 24 hours, we talked about that. So tips for healthy sleep behavior. Um, go to bed when you're sleepy. You can read through this, um, but um, try to get a sleep habit is best. It's hard to do that, you know, in our in our job. But also, um, if you volunteer as well, so you do your two twenty fours a week, and then you're a volunteer on your local fire department. And you're getting up at two a.m. to go on the um, tree down on the wires call as well. You're just you're not getting any sort of a a pattern. Um, don't exercise four hours before bedtime. A, a lot of people, you know, we work 12 hour shifts, we get home at 730 at night, and we got to work out. I mean, if that's, you know, if it's our day to, to hit the gym, and then we try to get to bed by 10, we're not going to sleep well. Um, a ritual, um, develop a ritual, like having a bath, or a um, in moderation, small whiskey in the hot tub, um, caffeine-free tea, whatever it might be. Try not to watch TV in your bedroom. Bedrooms should be set to be bedrooms, right? Um, there are activities that are okay in the bedroom and they help you sleep, um, but you shouldn't be going in there and watching TV for six hours because it just, it doesn't set you up for success. Um, don't eat heavy meals before bedtime. Avoid alcohol and caffeine for six hours. Everything in moderation. A shot of whiskey is not that bad. Wait, that sounds like denial to me. Um, comfortable and dark. Dark's a big thing for me. I'm, ugh, I got, I've got like two sets of room darkening shades. Um, white noise machine, fan, whatever it might be. Eating healthy. Uh, back to that, um, vegetables, fruits. So food, not product, um, will make you a lot healthier. There's a lot of different diets out there that you can look at, you know, keto and paleo and Atkins and all that. Um, and while I did very well with Atkins, there was a lot of product to it, you know, because I could eat steak and chicken all I wanted all day long. But if I wanted a snack, well, you know, and I can snack when I probably should have been having fruit or vegetables, you know, an apple or something. Um, so those natural type diets are actually a better lifestyle to get into, um, developing a habit of eating. Thing. And I like fruits and vegetables now that I never used to like before. So that's kind of cool, too. Um, BMI, body mass index, is, it's a good tool to show progress. It's, it's hard. What it does is it takes your weight and your height and gives you a BMI. It's not truly body fat. Um, it's hard to get body fat adequ accurately measured 
Um, like I have a very nice scale that tells me um, percentage of body fat, muscle, water, and um, bone. I don't know how accurate it is, but I know that it's consistent. So while I was losing all that weight, besides watching the weight come down, I could watch my water percentage and my bone percentage actually start to flip and get higher because my fat concentration was dropping. Um, but it's, so it's a good tool for trending. Um, good nutrition, portion control. That was my thing. Um, if a four, cause most portions are like four or six ounces. If four or six ounces of prime rib was good, <laughs> a 25 ounce King cut was better. And, uh, the potatoes and the sour cream and all that that went with it. So, um, small steps, baby steps. And, it, it, you know, and, and I also advise people, um, because I went extreme with this, I had gastric bypass. Um, if you need to lose the weight and you just, you struggle with it like I did, go see somebody. It's like emotional health, right? If you go, if you, if you go see somebody to get fixed emotionally and mentally, then you can go see somebody to get fixed physically too. But you still have to change your habits. Um, you know, after my surgery, I could have eaten M&Ms all day and not lost weight. So, um, you know, I, I took classes with it and, you know, I had to have counseling to go with it and all that stuff. But um, baby steps, you know, cutting out a full package of Oreos a day probably would have helped me a lot when I was younger. Food labels, uh, you know, so um, kind of figure out what you do best with for carbohydrates, fats, and proteins in a day. Um, eat healthier at work. You got to plan ahead. Um, or if you're lucky enough to be able to shop while you're at work, like, you know, I can. I can go into Hannaford's at, at work. Um, stay to the outside. Stay away from the middle. Um, and take, when you're, in, when you're working EMS or fire, take a um a cooler with you um because you know you could be in the truck for 12 straight hours and so take your food with you so that you're not stopping and buying junk on the way back <laughs> moderate intake of caffeine can have health benefits but we tend to have a lot of caffeine on a 24-hour shift you know it's 4 30 in the morning and you're driving back from portland maine or boston or dartmouth or worcester or wherever um yeah we 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 eat a ring ding and a giant coffee and uh we think that's probably not good for us um a pair is, what's, what's the alternative at 2 a.m to keep you up you know you wake up out of a dead sleep and then there it's like none. all right there is none that's a, yeah. that's the problem that's the problem with this job is that there are times where we have to eat or drink shit that we shouldn't so around the rest of that we should do everything we can to do better right um but if at 2 a.m you have a coffee and an apple that's certainly better than a coffee and a snickers bar and a ring ding you know um so th apparently if you leave food out it's bad it goes bad and that's that's not good for you um although i've never eaten a pizza the morning after that killed me um, right. And you come down, it's still on the table. It's pizza, right? Discard room, discard food left at room temperature more than two hours. How the hell are we supposed to eat on the job? You cook your food. Oh, the tones go off. You take it off the burner. You set it next on the coal burner. You go do your call two and a half hours later, you come back and you finish your dinner. I don't get it. Wash utensils, uh, wash tabletops. Right. Um, I try to do that at work myself because I don't know what the clowns before me did. Um, I don't know, you know, whether there's been mice running around the table, who knows? So um, just be cognizant of that. Good body weight. I talked about doing, you know, a couple of push ups and a couple of sit ups a day. Flexibility, that's my weak spot. Um, stretching a little and uh, just a little, a little bit of cardio work. Nothing crazy, you know, walking. Just make yourself a little healthier and you will stay healthier at work or because of work. Um, 30 minutes, at least three times a week of something.
check with your physician. Um, moderate exercise, increasing your heart rate. Whoops, can't see that. 60 to 73%. Whoo, baby. That's up there. Um, you got to do that at least three times a week. Uh, swimming, bicycling, jogging. So jogging isn't always the best thing for our knees and our joints. Um, walking, um, bicycling is very, according to my orthopedic surgeon, who um, said it's much better on my knees than walking is. Uh, swimming is great. And swimming is good because it takes the um, all the gravitational pull off your joints. So like uh, it, it helps with back pain. Um, Secondhand smoke, right? Uh, sitting in the back of my parents' car, my entire young adult, my entire young life, while they smoked with the windows up. Sons of bitches. Um, moderation, alcohol and caffeine. Don't drive under the influence of anything. Don't work under the influence of anything. And, and when we talk about work under the influence of anything, Benadryl. Benadryl makes you sleepy. You probably shouldn't take that and go to work. Isn't there an RSA against that? Against which? Well, against uh, <clears throat> working, in, I think it was uh, in EMS, well, under the influence of alcohol, specifically. Not that I'm aware of. Um, okay. I know all systems have a rule about it, but I, I don't know if it Obviously. exists or not. So I'm not, I'm not sure. I, it there probably should be, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I thought I heard something about that before. That was all. Yeah, no, that's fine. It, it could be. Um, sunscreen when outdoors, right? Keep yourself safe. Um, smoke detectors in your house. I don't really know how some of these uh, um, really affect our class, but anyways, we'll cover it. Um, go to your doctors if you're sick. Use protective equipment when you recreate. Um, so the drummer from Rush, Neil Peart, uh, rest in peace. Um, rode motorcycles between his concert dates. The other guys flew jets, right, in private jets. He rode a motorcycle, um, and um, he wrote a bunch of books about it. But I learned this from him. It's called ATGAT, all the gear, all the time. I now wear boots, pants, jacket, and helmet, and gloves every time I ride. Um, and I used to go out on a rice rocket with shorts and a T-shirt on and nothing else, you know. So... Um, you know, if I bang my head, I want to, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to survive the fatal crash anyways, but it's the one that, eh, you just bang your head a little bit that I want to survive that one unhurt. So helmets, all that stuff. Uh, see a dentist. Um, I already talked about that. Um, families have conflict with our work. I tell everyone, if you work and or volunteer 100 hours a week, don't expect to stay married. Don't expect to date anyone very long. Um, at some point, you got to take time off and um, spend time with your family. Um, picture my wife working all freaking day. Okay, Now, I cook most of the meals, mind you but she does the big holidays. So picture her all day slaving over a hot stove for Christmas dinner. And I have my pager on and the tone goes off and I get up in the middle of Christmas dinner and go to a tree on the wires or a car accident or whatever. That's probably not gonna go over well, okay? That causes marital stress or so the counselor told me. All right. Um, 69% of all employees say work significant source of stress. No kidding. So, all right, scene safety. This is a big one. I want to spend a little bit of time on this, and this is going to kind of end it for us today. Um, I told you guys the other night that don't let me scare you off. Um, there are things that we can be exposed to or will be exposed to that are dangerous. But if I thought there was a daily chance of death or, or um, uh, uh, being delimbed, I would have done everything I could to steer my kids away from this career field. <clears throat> I love this career. Love it. But 
we have to be safe and we have to be aware around us, okay? Um, you have to have your eyes open and aware all the time. So somebody tell me what's wrong with this picture. She's blocking the mirror. <laughs> that would drive me nuts. Yeah. Well, she's looking at the placard with a pair of binoculars. If you can see the placard without binoculars, you're too damn close, right? And she's so, probably not wearing a seatbelt either. Well, they're not moving. She's checking the placard. Oh, okay. So hazardous materials, we can certainly get in trouble with that. Terrorist events, apparently so. Um, we can get hurt rescuing people people of violence and weapons. Now, keep in mind, anything can be used as a weapon. I read a, um, an article once that um, a bunch of these self-defense um, terrorism experts said that if on each of those aircraft on 9-11, if one person had a cane and was willing to stand up and use it, 9-11 would have been a whole different event because um, they had little box cutters perfectly good to cut throats with and stuff if you're in their hands but with a cane you can use it as a bat you can use it as a poking um thing you can grab behind their neck and pull them to you and beat the living shit right out of them right you can stomp on them with it you can knock their teeth out when i fly now i fly with a cane okay and it's really cool because when you go up to um the uh, tsa checkpoint they're like "Ooh, sir would you like a golf cart why yes i would you know Doing the Queen's wave, going through Logan in a golf cart, all right? And you can fly with it. And why do you fly with it? Because they won't let me fly with a baseball bat. So canes, I got clocked once by this little old lady. She was flirting with me. She was like 90 years old. I was like 25. And uh, she reached out to tap me, a love tap with her cane, hit me across the shin, dropped me right to the ground in tears. Anything can be used as a weapon. It is not safe to, if it's not safe to approach a scene, stay away from it. If you can see that building, they can see you. If you can see one building between you and them, they can still shoot at you, okay? Call PD, have them wait until they get there and clear you in. But keep in mind, police officers are humans too. Police officers tend to focus on hands. Show me your hands, show me your hands, right? I walked in, I got cleared into a scene once for a suicidal patient. Guy sitting on the couch, cop standing at the end. Good friend of mine, known him a long time. I look at the cop, I look at the guy, I look at the cop, I look at the guy, I look at the shotgun on the back of the couch and said, dude, what about the shotgun on the back of the couch? He just, he didn't see it. Keep your eyes open. You are ultimately responsible for your own safety. Develop a plan. You and your partner walk in some place that you're like, gee, should we really do this or not? If you have a regular partner every shift, this is perfect. Just come up with a plan to start. I work with two different people every week, and that's nice. We can do this. Um, but there was a period in time where I worked with somebody different every week. Um, but walk up and just say, hey, look, if something happens, drop your bags and let's, let's, head, let's head for the truck. Okay? Always take a portable radio in with you. Don't assume your partner will have one because they may not take one in. And if you two get separated, you need to be able to talk to each other. You also need to be able to call for help. You need to be able to yell to dispatch it. You're running away screaming um, and you need to send the air cab in for me, okay? Um, so if you're going to an area that you've had concerns with, absolutely, turn your lights and sirens off early. Um, but if you're going, to, you know, the stereotypical nice neighborhood and you're going for the little old lady with chest pain, you want to leave your lights on, that's fine. But um, Drive a few feet past. So as you're pulling up to the house, look at one side, look at the front, and drive just past it so you can look at that other side. Fire officers should be doing this, right? It's a scene size up from the road. Um, what are we looking for? We're looking for signs of potential violence. Crowds, alcohol, drugs, big chains, big dogs, big fences. Um, fire, fire would be a bad one too, okay? Any of these things can hurt you. We know well, violence, but violence can come from any of this other stuff. A guy's had a couple of beers, right? We all know somebody, maybe we know him now, maybe it was when we were in high school. He's a really nice guy until he drinks and then he's an asshole. 
Well, the truth is, deep down, he's an asshole, and the alcohol just lets the inner asshole out. Okay, so a couple of beers, and this dude at the house can become that asshole, and then strike out at us because he thinks we're hurting somebody. Okay, um, you know, we start an IV, and they go, "Ow!" and they, and then the guy jumps us. Okay, um, we do a finger stick for blood sugar. Ow! and he jumps us. Obviously, firearms get out. Um, swords you know swords over the mantelpiece keep an eye on those um family members and bystanders can hurt us pets can certainly hurt us um retreat radio reevaluate you see something going on get out get on the radio call for help and 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 retreat run um don't use the word retreat though i thought that was a commonly understood expression I got into a fight with a guy in a house and uh, literally threw him over a chair, turned at my partner and went, retreat. And she stood there staring at me like a deer in the headlights. I said, retreat. And I grabbed her by the back of her collar and dragged her out of the building. Like, what part of retreat? Well, I, I didn't know what you meant. Okay, run. Okay, run. Everybody knows that word. All right, now color codes. This guy, Jeff Cooper, uh, developed a company, a training company called Gunsight out in Arizona. He was a Marine Corps lieutenant colonel um, and went into the uh, training sector. And he came up with these color codes for personal safety. I use these color codes, personal safety, and on EMS calls, not just for safety, but for patient care. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? So condition white is I'm sitting at home. I'm in my recliner. I got my bowl of cheesy poofs. I'm watching the Red Sox. I know nothing about what's going on around me. That's condition white. I have no what we call situational awareness. Okay. It's okay to be in white when you're securely locked away in your house. That's fine. When you are at work, or you are out in public, you should never have those blinders on. You should always be in what we call condition yellow. Condition yellow is you just, you know what's around you, okay? An example of this, I'm sitting in a restaurant back when I was very fat still, and I was waiting for my 24 ounce steak. And I used, I when I used to go to restaurants, I would go off hours, like two o'clock in the afternoon, right? The place is almost empty, it's great. And I always sit in the corner, my back against the wall. And I'm reading a Kindle. I've got my Kindle up on the table and there's only two other people eating. They're at one table, it's a, uh, a, male, a man and a woman. So I can see over my Kindle and I've ordered my dinner and I just, I know where my fire exit is. It's the same hallway right here where the bathroom is. I used to drink four liters of Diet Coke a day. I used to go to the bathroom a lot too. So I know the bathroom is, I know where the um, smoke, uh, a fire exit is. Um, I know where the only other people in the building are. I'm just, I'm alert, I'm aware. When the dude yells at the woman and um, uses a couple of very bad words in her direction. So now I know there's potentially a threat of violence in this place where I am. I go to condition orange. Condition orange is I'm more tuned into what's going on right there now. I'm still aware of everything else and I've made a plan. My plan is I brought my telephone out and put it on the table. If he escalates or does not de-escalate, I'm gonna call 911. I'm gonna call 911. I'm just gonna leave it on speakerphone and let them listen to this, right? I don't even have to say a word, they can hear it, right? Um, if he strikes her, what am I gonna do, right? So that's orange, I have a plan. Red is when that trigger event occurs and now I act. Just before he started yelling at her, smoke came pouring out of the kitchen, by the way. I was wondering why my steak was taking so long. And so I'd, I'd already pulled out my phone because I've gone from yellow to orange, like shit, the restaurant's on fire. So if the smoke detector goes off, if the smoke gets worse, if it doesn't get left, 
I'm going to just dial 911 and head out the fire exit, right? So the smoke died down. The guy came out and said, hey, I'm really sorry about your steak. We're doing another one. Okay, so now I'm back in yellow. That's when this guy yells at, at, at the girl. So I don't want to get physically involved in this. I don't, right, domestic violence is very unsafe for everybody. More police officers used to get shot on DV calls than any other call. Because um, they go in and the guy doing the DV shoots at him. Or, here's the ugly one. When the officer's taking him down, or if I'm intervening, he's beating the hell out of her, and I come over and intervene, the women in a lot of cases will then strike out at that person defending their abuser. You know, so I don't want to get physically involved in this. But if he does something stupid, I'm like, I can shoot him from here, right? So that's red. If I have to run or shoot, that's red. How do I use this with EMS? Well, I'm always in yellow when I leave the house. When I pull up to that house and I look at the one side, I look at the front, and I look at the other side, that's just yellow. I know what my hazards are. As I walk up the stairs, hello, ambulance, and you know, you hear this nice little lady go, uh, I'm upstairs, and the lights are on, and there's no loud, you know, everything looks great. You walk upstairs, I'm still in yellow, right? I walk into the room, and she doesn't look healthy, right? She looks sick. I've identified a potential hazard to her, and I've gone into orange. So now I'm developing a plan. I'm going to do this, this, and this for her. If this, this, and this does not work, then I will do this, and that's red. So what I think should work easily and quickly is my orange. If I have to suddenly get very aggressive and start to ventilate somebody, or I have to defibrillate somebody, that's red. So the more you do this every day, the easier it is to do it every day. If you've never been in Walmart when the lights went off, hoo hoo baby, you haven't lived, right? You hear people running and screaming, you hear stuff being you know, jammed into coat pockets. Um, and, uh, but I knew there was nobody around me. And I pulled my flashlight out of my pocket because I always carry a flashlight. And I just double checked, made sure nobody was running towards me that I'm, I'm not worried about being attacked. I'm worried about somebody running into me and hurting me, right? So it's just white. I'm home. I'm in the safety of my own house. Um, I mean, you saw it when my son pulled up, right? I was, I was alert and aware of everything around me. I saw a car slow down at my driveway. I turned to look. He pulled into my driveway. I went orange. It's a car I don't recognize. If he gets out and he comes around that gate, I'm going red. Um, the gate opened. It's an electronic gate. He had to have the code. It's somebody I know. It's some, and I've only given the code to my family members. So it's, it's a family member of some sort, right? So ah, back to yellow. But when the car pulled up, right, I excused myself, got up, walked to the stairs and saw it was, was Sam. Okay. So the other thing, do not let anybody get between you and the door. You're in an ambulance call. I don't let people get behind me. Right. And some of it is just, it's habit now. So you're taking care of grandma who's 90 years old and you're trying to do an EKG and grandpa's standing right behind you looking over your shoulder. I say to him, sir, can you tell you what, why don't you sit down right next to us so you can keep an eye on what's going on. But this way I don't stand up quick and knock you over and break a hip or something. It's just, it's habit. I don't let people get behind me. I always know where my exits are. Um, I know where the doors are. I know where a window is if I if I really end up needing that. Um, and I know how I can escape. And that goes whether I'm in Walmart, I'm at Outback Steakhouse, or I'm on an ambulance call. Um, and I'm, being in this yellow is not emotionally or physically stressing. Orange is, orange is that alarm state, alarm state, okay? So, um, you can't you can't live in orange, but you can certainly be in yellow most of the time. And again, you know, I go to a car, and uh, this guy's blue. Okay, I'm gonna put him on oxygen. If that doesn't fix it, then I'm going to do this, this, and this. All right. So if he doesn't get better, red is what am I doing next? Okay. Do you guys have any questions on that? A lot of people think I'm paranoid 
and um, 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 when I preach this stuff. But um, you know, I've I've been I've been pretty lucky in EMS. I've had a couple of knives pulled on me, um, and one of them took me completely by surprise. Um, uh, I've been in a a fair number of fights, all out god awful brawls. Um, multiple people, multiple fists and, and feet flying, trying to break arms and legs, all kinds of shit. Um, and what I have found is that now that incident has, well, A, I don't work in Rochester anymore, but um, also I'm more alert to this stuff now. Um, and also <laughs> I can cheat. Um, if you become aggressive towards me, um, I can have somebody hold you down and I can stick a needle in your arm and three minutes from now, um, I can do anything I want to you and you will not wake up. I can cut your arms off and you won't, you won't wake up from it. Um, you guys can't do that. So, um, you know, if it's good enough for me to still do, even though I have tricks like that, it's certainly something that everybody can benefit from.